Well, it looks like it's 1230 on my clock. Uh, so maybe, Brad, uh, we can get started with, with uh, this next session. So, uh, so Brad and I uh, have the honor of uh, uh, co-leading uh, the second session of the day, disease phenotyping. Uh, we ask that uh, everyone stay on mute when they're not presenting and also turn off their cameras so we don't have any bandwidth issues. Uh, and we will be working hard and hopefully not have to break in uh, at any time uh, to keep us on the schedule. And so with that, uh, I'll start by introducing Dr. McRae. He's from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And he'll be discussing orthogonal phenotyping and disease definition. Over to you, Cal. George, thanks very much uh, for the introduction and thanks to you and to the organizers for the invitation to speak. I'm going to talk, as George said, about uh, orthogonal phenotypes and disease definition, uh, a rate limiting step in much of what we do in network medicine, and indeed all of biomedical science. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, probably the most important since it's the one that you can't measure is academic self-interest. Uh, phenotypes are really rate limiting in almost everything we do in medicine uh, and genetics, which is probably the origin of the definition of the entire um, uh, ontology of phenotypes. Uh, they offer you uh, probably the only means to uh, causality in biomedicine, and they're also uh, pretty uh, excellent ways of building a genetic case for um, moving to proximate points for intervention. But almost every a uh, phenotype that we've looked at, and this is as a community, not just us personally, is restricted um, to either very highly penetrant, very rare phenotypes, or rather common aggregates uh, of what seem like relatively imprecise phenotypes, even if only because despite their apparent high heritability, we've been unable to detect much in the way of large effect genetic alleles. And the premise of this talk is that the vast majority of phenotypes from analogy with many other species, disease or other, are likely to lie in this middle diagonal uh, and either be uh, traits that are uh, unmeasured uh, or unmeasurable potentially, uh, or traits that require some modifiers, i.e. they are latent and cannot be uh, identified simply by uh, inspection. So we began several years ago to think about uh, a discrete strategy uh, to not only select disease phenotypes, but to select them uh, by creating novel traits for which we already uh, were able to identify large effect size genetic uh, alleles. And this would allow us essentially to redefine disease crossing existing disease silos, would improve alignment with patient level problems in as much as you're able to identify things that people are actually complaining of, map them mechanistically and develop hopefully in a fairly rapid cycle, um, new uh, therapeutics. And then finally, uh, if we were able to do this, it would create a reproducible pipeline uh, and begin to introduce mechanism at an individual patient level. So we're thinking very quickly about what the traditional de disease definitions are based on. They're usually a fairly late stage aggregate of symptoms, signs, and outcomes, patterns recognized in many instances in the Middle Ages. Uh, typically, these are late stage post presentation as you're already on this red arrow in this graph that uh, depicts health uh, and disease on this axis, birth uh, to death time uh, on the uh, X axis. And in fact, the predominant difficulty with this entire strategy is that once you've locked yourself into a set of phenotypes, you really uh, are then deriving all of your information based on many of these traits. And I believe this is one of the the fundamental limitations in modern biomedicine is much of what we measure was dictated um, really by virtue of me measurement convenience rather than biological significance. The last few years, uh, obviously many fields, but in particular in cardiovascular medicine, folks have begun to uh, uh, have a more strategic approach to this, working backwards from these original disease definitions progressively to preventative biomarkers, but you're still constrained, even although these have uh, remarkably been quite effective in a significant number of instances, still constrained by the ultimate end phenotypes, which in many instances are uh, mechanistically obscure, even if only as a direct virtue of their commonality. What ultimately we'd really like to do is to build a framework in which the uh, final 
um, outcomes are pretty much traditional, uh, i.e. they're uh, hard outcomes that we can relate to existing phenotypes so that we don't throw away the entire disease nosology that we've developed. But to begin a much more rigorous, uh, much more refined um, trajectory of quantitative traits, uh, that really I, I allow you to identify even the very earliest de deviations from wellness. Uh, we recognize largely because it's the only bounded data set in all of biomedicine uh, that a genome is actually a very reasonable uh, place uh, on which to uh, uh, find one's uh, data architecture. And so we've begun to uh, try and do this strategically uh, using a variety of different tools. In order to do this, you have to obviously change dramatically what you measure. If you add all of clinical phenotyping uh, that has ever been performed, it ends up being something in the region of about 10 to the four phenotypes. This is actually remarkably similar to all the other organism uh, phenotype ontologies. It's not surprising. There's just a limit to what we as a community have conceived of in, with respect to uh, the phenotypes we can measure. Uh, and this obviously is, is even poorly matched to the base differences in uh, between any two individuals on this call in terms of their genomes, uh, probably 10 to the 6 missense variants uh, across the, uh, or sorry, uh, single nucleotide variants, not all missense, across the genome between each of us on the call. And obviously, uh, as you've heard during the course even of uh, this morning, uh, irreducible complexity at every other level. And then when we think about conditioning variables, we've really not measured almost any of the exposure variables. You heard a beautiful talk from Laszlo talking about uh, nutritional exposures, but in reality, we essentially measure alcohol and tobacco and then only by indirect report. So what we began was a strategy to try and discover and select new disease relevant dynamic phenotypes uh, through a number of uh, overlapping complementary strategies, reanalyzing uh, existing data to extract new information using artificial intelligence, or using perturbations uh, that might actually uh, leverage latent phenotypes captured within these existing traits. Uh, to study um, uh, new phenotypes, we created a series uh, of cellular endpoints. The first instance of this could be done for almost any set of traits. We picked cell biology sim simply since it's one of the most um, uh, uh, limiting um, layers in, the, in any a multi-omic strategy, and it is actually probably the unit of evolution that antedated um, multicellular organisms uh, by probably uh, over a billion years. And ultimately, what we'd like to imagine is that almost any set of human responses could be incorporated. One of the nice things about doing some of this by design is that you can take a strategy that really exploits existing data collection, uh, both the velocity uh, and volume, uh, and then simply uh, add new analytics or new perturbations to begin to extract much more uh, useful biological information. I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to show you the general strategy. And obviously, in the time we have today, can't really cover a huge amount. But cellular perturbations are remarkably powerful, even if only because they perturb what are essentially homeostatic systems. Most of the, the gene networks that we uh, think about and imagine are really highly um, uh, homeostatic. And in many instances, the genes that, uh, whose transcription does not change are likely to be the most potent central regulators in most uh, networks. Stresses can often expose latent differences and effect sizes can be selected so that uh, discovery cohorts are really small. This is just a simple example using uh, some very uh, straightforward cell morphology parameters. And you can see the emergence, the almost binary emergence of a completely new population of cells uh, in orange. Uh, and these are really just morphologic changes driving uh, cell phenotypes in the, in the presence of simple small molecules. So far, we've done this for about 7,500 patients. We've done it in the first instance using only peripheral blood. You can imagine doing it for almost any trait for which it's possible to measure uh, any cellular response. Uh, we've genotyped about 2,200 of these. We've screened about 35 perturbations and identified 146 genetic loci uh, across 375 novel phenotypes. And interestingly, these can all be detected in fewer than 1,000 individuals uh, with obviously the requisite number of controls. Uh, the types of perturbations you can use can be almost um, uh, infinite. 
some of uh, these could be drugs, they can be uh, microbial peptides, microbial small molecules, they can be nutritional elements. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we can actually addition many of these to uh, identify those with the most interesting and, and uh, approachable biological signals. Uh, the compounds um, are very straightforward to swap in and swap out. These are all highly scalable assays as they're based on existing uh, clinical tools and designed, for example, to be uh, feasible for costs that are under $5 per sample. The results from uh, these simple morphometric assays are, are just displayed here. Simple dimensionality reduction of what is an incredibly complicated matrix of maybe as many as uh, 24 million novel phenotypes allows you to be able to map uh, these uh, in very short order using very small numbers of individuals. Importantly, the genetics then allow you to map these variants directly onto existing disease loci, and we can select those that are very large effect sizes. For example, uh, in many instances, we're seeing genome-wide significance with fewer uh, than 150 individuals, and this parallels a lot of other latent phenotypes such as atrial fibrillation and senomacular degeneration, where the effect sizes are, in some instances, almost an order of magnitude larger than those seen with traditional common allele genetics. We can do this for cell physiology. We built a fairly uh, simple set of high throughput microscopy tools to look at large populations of cells in the context of ionic perturbations of peripheral blood. So this is electrohematology, if you will. Uh, use simple neural nets to deconvolute the cell type and then subsequently uh, the, the uh, individual ionic or metabolic transients uh, directly connecting with um, the biology of the cells in individual patients, and then relating that obviously in the long run to their underlying disease biologies. And I'll show you a concrete example of that in a minute. Similarly with AI, uh, it's possible to take existing uh, uh, imaging data sets and to begin to deconvolute them into a series of subsets using um, either directed or indirected, i.e. trained with objective labels or simply using uh, hard outcomes. Um, to identify novel metrics. Uh, and these, again, as you might expect, because they've never really been tested before, are often able to identify a fairly large effect size, um, significant genetic effects, uh, which have previously not been identified. This uh, phenotype stack is by design uh, integrated into a clinical workflow. So we're using, as I mentioned, uh, clinical cytometry, simple microscopy, echo AI, those types of things are already feasible using uh, conventional databases and electronic health records, uh, standard genetics, and uh, a series of measured perturbations. And the nice thing about this is we're able to actually select the phenotypes that we want to progress. So for example, the 146 loci that we've identified with cytometry were selected based on thresholds for effect sizes and uh, uh, existing uh, and identifiable genetic loci. Uh, what we're trying to do is build a reproducible pipeline that allows us to uh, take these new phenotypes to map the genes fairly effectively, to then model them uh, using either the original cell types in ex vivo uh, or in uh, human-derived cell types and move on to in vivo confirmation very effectively before undertaking rapid uh, cycle therapeutic screens. Uh, this is just a sort of suite of uh, the top 20 that we've uh, progressed along this entire pathway, but you can see a lot of uh, fairly um, um, uh, interesting and in some instances uh, in intuitively meaningful uh, elements. For example, there's a, a nice locus for aortic stenosis, which is a, a, a matrix protein that is bizarrely abnormal in uh, basophils. This uh, is a glycosyl transfer gene that actually is involved in calcification, and we're now building those assays ex vivo in order to uh, identify uh, suppressors and then move forward uh, to try and test these pathways in animal models and then ultimately in humans. Uh, here's one very straightforward example. We were able to identify the mechano uh, transduction channel, piezo one was upregulated in diabetes very consistently, particularly in neutrophils. Uh, less, slow, less so uh, in lymphocytes, uh, but also observed in a subset of individuals in platelets. This is a uh, very clearly definable bottom uh, left panel, high response group to the uh, piezo-1 activator, Yoda-1. Uh, piezo-1 uh, 
uh, activation in these cells not only leads to uh, increased uh, phosphatidylserine exposure in red cells, but also in platelets. And there's actually uh, um, a clinically observable increase in uh, these parameters using an exome labels or other tools um, um, based uh, uh, on clinical samples in about 20% uh, of diabetics. Uh, when we built an ex vivo assay uh, for this, you can see that uh, in uh, fully uh, anticoagulated blood, there's still the ability to induce mechanotransduced uh, clot in an 80% stenosis, uh, and this can be uh, significantly diminished, uh, the time to occlusion um, uh, uh, dramatically uh, reduced by peptide-based inhibition of PXO1. And so uh, what we've also done in a couple of animal models is show that this actually appears to be a functional clonal selection in the bone marrow. Uh, the piezo one is uh, upregulation is selected for uh, based on simple uh, hyperglycemia. And this now seems to be a reproducible uh, target for physiologic clonal selection. So ultimately what we'd like to do is to build these types of phenotypes in a way that they link um, uh, discovery, uh, uh, translation, and ultimately even care delivery by building the same tools uh, and using them in both places. Uh, and ideally, uh, selecting new disease phenotypes that not only are, are ab initio patient relevant, but also ab initio are tractable for drug discovery. So in summary, organ-specific static phenotypes uh, that we've, to a large extent, uh, focused on for the last couple of hundred years are relatively low in information content. Biomedical phenotyping is non-systematic by design. Uh, many of the traits that we study are legacy and redundant. There have been very many new phenotypes in the last hundred years, but they can be systematically discovered. They can be selected for utility and rapidly exploited by design. Ideally, we can build systems that integrate these both with discovery and care at the same time. And the new high information content phenotypes that you can identify using this, these or many other methods leverage all existing approaches, including in particular the network analysis that are at the core uh, of this meeting. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, uh, Dr. Lascalzo for his long-term support and supervision. Um, this work that I presented today was uh, pioneered by Rahul Deo and Juan Bijou, uh, and Shinichi Goto, Stancho, Elidan, and Maximilius, and Zara Arian also contributed. Uh, the work was funded by uh, the H.A. Verily, um, Quest Diagnostics and AstraZeneca. Thank you to them and thank you to you for your attention. Thanks, Calum. That was a, a very comprehensive and uh, interesting talk. Are there any questions? Please send them through the chat and give it a second to populate. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start uh, by asking a little bit more about your strategy for connecting different elements of the phenotype stack, which of course is something that I think a lot of the people on the in, the in the group here might have interest in, especially as you get more towards the end around the physiome where circuits around physiology uh, may have been described previously, but haven't been contemporized in a way that would adapt well to large omics platforms. What, what strategies have you been using to try to get us to that side of the uh, spectrum of uh, phenotype stack so far? So this was actually one of the design features of our overall program is if you think about it, uh, what, what we're really trying to do is come up with generalizable insights that cross each of the layers. And probably the only things that are obvious in this space that allow you to do that are perturbations and the most rigorous perturbations that are applicable all the way from a single dipole moment uh, in a molecule all the way up to uh, physiome or even to populations. Uh, our physical and chemical challenges. And so, in fact, in almost every instance, what we're doing is actually using doses, for example, of a chemical perturbation without actually testing physical perturbations as well, that can be applied to the whole organism. And I think that's one of the most critical elements of this, uh, because it allows you to then test episodically uh, individual perturbations over time. Uh, you can translate those um, not only uh, from a single cell or a single molecule level, all the way up to uh, population and, and physiome, as you uh, rightly identify, which is very tough to, uh, to be able to connect with the remainder of the, the biology that we observe. And then that was really at the core of our uh, design strategy. Great. 
Big George had a quick question. We're down to a minute. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about challenges in estimating the history of some of the patients before they come to your attention and the way that you would integrate them into your pipeline. That's a, a really important question. Yes, George, absolutely. We, I mean, obviously we built this so it can be done repeatedly. We're also able to retrospectively infer some of these by mapping them onto some existing cellular phenotypes in, in uh, prevalent bioassays. But in the long run, we believe it, it will be important to uh, um, uh, drive these trajectories forward and, and measure them empirically. And typically, in most of medicine, unfortunately, we tend to just do uh, episodic cross-section rather than think about quantitative trajectory building, which I believe is going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Well, well. Uh, thank you, Callum, for that great talk. Uh, let's move on now to Dr. Lucis. Uh, Dr. Lucis is coming to us from UCLA, and we'll be talking about complex phenotypes and genomics. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> um, so I'm sorry here. Let's see. Um, so our lab works on common complex cardiometabolic disorders such as atherosclerosis or uh, heart failure. And uh, these are traits that are, these are disorders that are involve multiple genes and environmental factors, very complex. And today I'll tell you about how we're using network modeling to, to examine some of these. I should say at the beginning that we're really not trying to develop uh, new methods for network modeling, but we're, our lab is primarily using networks. Um, so I will tell you three very short stories. The first involves non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, which is a common cause of liver failure and liver cancer. Uh, our approaches are, are, are population-based. Um, we use mice in part to get around the phenotyping problem because we have access to tissues, we can control the environment and so on. And so um, uh, we have developed about 10 years ago, a, a, a mouse resource that we call the hybrid mouse diversity panel. It consists of a hundred commercially available diverse inbred strains of mice. And it has sufficient power. It's not a lot of power, but a sufficient power to, to, to map at least the major uh, uh, loci using association pretty much as, as, as in GWAS studies, human GWAS studies. It also has the advantage of systems genetics. The data are cumulative. And um, so on this next slide here, um, I'm showing you uh, the uh, levels of triglyceride in liver across these 100 strains after feeding them a high fat, high sucrose diet for eight weeks. Right? And you can see there's tremendous variation. So our goal then is to understand the genetics of this, this variation. Uh, we use uh, what we call systems genetics. It's uh, uh, look, combining multi-omics with, uh, with clinical traits. So in this case, in the, in the case of these mice, this mouse panel, uh, most of the strains have been sequenced. So we have information about gene space. We can carry out transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, look at the microbiome and so on and try to integrate those traits with the clinical traits. Um, primarily for this, we use correlation structure, uh, genetic mapping, and networks. Okay, so in the case of, of uh, the NAFLD study, then we carried out transcriptomics in liver on all 100 inbred strains of mice. So we have the clinical traits and we have the uh, expression data. Uh, we used a method, uh, a network method developed by Shaw Yang at UCLA. It's called Mergeomics. And this has uh, sort of two steps. The first step is to, uh, to take uh, canonical pathways, uh, keg pathways and so on. Or one could use modules constructed based on various approaches. Um, and, and, and look at these pathways to see if they're involved in associated with the clinical trait. And the way this works is that we, let's say in this pathway, we have four genes. We identify the SNPs that regulate these genes, right? They could be cis-regulated or trans-regulated. 
that we identify these SNPs. And then we ask, are these individual SNPs associated with the trait? In this case, fatty liver disease, right? Or, or liver triglyceride. If the cumulative uh, aggregate uh, uh, associations are significant, we pick that pathway and now we put it on top of a, what's called a, a, a Bayesian type network. It's, it's really, it's based on correlation structure, but, but using Bayesian statistics, it's, I, I guess you would call it semi-causal. And what we found in this case, and this, is, this, this study was published previously, we found four uh, sort of sub-networks strongly associated with fatty liver disease, right? And they're shown here. These subnetworks interestingly contain a number of human GWAS genes associated with fatty liver, such as PNPLA3. But so these networks then have these hubs, which we call key drivers, right? They don't have to be causal, but they're clearly key. And so what we've done is we've taken these key drivers, fatty acid synthase, pyruvate kinase, liver red cell, this is a protein involved in mitochondrial uh, 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 cristae formation structure. And we've tested these uh, 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 for causality in vivo. And initially what we did was uh, we simply knocked these down using adenovirus in mice again. And you can see that each of these key driver genes significantly reduced triglyceride levels, right? And we've gone down to study these, some of these in, in greater detail, particularly PKLR. Right? Um, uh, so the, I guess the lesson here is that, that this network modeling can be very useful in actually identifying causal genes. It tells us about overall pathways. In this case, what we found was that these pathways uh, uh, were strongly enriched from mitochondrial genes. And, and that was interesting to us. But it also led to the identification of genes. Okay, the second story I'm gonna tell you about has to do with uh, protein networks. Uh, we're interested in heart failure and we've been looking at uh, 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 a variety of heart phenotypes. In this case, I'm gonna primarily just tell you about the protein network. So again, here we looked at these 100 inbred strains of mice. And we did proteomics with Ben Parker at, in Melbourne, Australia on heart, right? We looked at all hearts of all hundred strains. And in this study here that uh, I'm gonna tell you about, we were particularly interested in mitochondrial proteins. In other studies, we've related mitochondria to heart failure phenotypes. So we took, there are about 1100 known mitochondrial proteins. About 800 of these were seen by Ben in, in his proteomic study. So we took these and we, we used, in this case, weighted gene correlation network analysis developed by Steve Horvath at UCLA. And so we, uh, using this, we obtained five rather tight clusters. Right? Um, uh, three of these actually uh, mapped by association to specific loci in the genome. Right? And all three had SNPs that, uh, that uh, regulated in trance many mitochondrial proteins. And I should, should say this is the work of Karthik Krishnan, who is a former postdoc, now at an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. And these are shown here as circa plots, right? So this complex, this chromosome 13 locus, it regulates complex one proteins, all of these are complex one proteins. At, the, uh, uh, at that SNP here, the peak SNP, there's a strong candidate. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but there's a microRNA that regulates the candidate. But uh, uh, um, uh, we, we validated this in vivo, right? Uh, the second locus uh, is, uh, affects a variety of genes, but many of them are involved in coenzyme Q metabolism. Very good candidate, which we validated coenzyme Q here. The third locus is it consists of mitochondrial ribosome proteins. Mitochondria have their own trans, uh, translation system, ribosomes. And here is we haven't validated it yet, but it's a it's a very strong candidate. 
previously valid, you know, in, involved in my, mitochondrial ribosome uh, uh, function, LRPPRC. So interestingly, each of these loci, each of these loci, the SNPs, peak SNPs, were associated strongly with heart weight, right? There was one phenotype we had in this study. And in each case, the, the SNP that increased mitochondrial function resulted in reduced heart weight, right? So this is part of a larger study. We're particularly interested in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But uh, these kinds of data then are helpful for us in terms of understanding the genetics of heart failure. The third study that I'll tell you about is the one that I wrote up for the abstract. Um, it involves identification of endocrine mediators of cross tissue networks, right? Tissues uh, talk to each other. So the networks in those tissues, of course, have to talk to each other. How is this mediated? Um, so this really began with a, a study uh, by Marcus Selden that was uh, a couple of years ago. He's a former postdoc now, a an associate or an assistant professor at University of Irvine, California, Irvine. But it's, it's a very simple procedure to identify novel endocrine factors, right? There are many proteins are secreted. We don't know what most of them do. And it's, it's a very simple procedure. So again, we look at our hundred strains of mice. We look at individual proteins in one tissue and we ask, these are of course perturbed by genetics. We ask if those proteins are correlated with gene expression, global gene expression in a second tissue, suggestive of uh, 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 a signaling, endocrine signaling pathway. You know, we can pick for example, the secreted proteins here. And so uh, let me just show you the example of leptin. We know that leptin is produced by adipose and that it acts on hypothalamus, right? Um, if we take all of the genes in this case, we've taken all the genes in adipose and for each one we've asked how correlated is, is it with overall gene expression in hypothalamus, right? And this is just, uh, it's done by looking at the negative log base 10 of the p-values. And what you see is this sort of normal distribution with skewing out here, right? Okay, so these genes out here are more strongly correlated. Where is leptin? Leptin's way out here, right? And why is this? It's because leptin produced by adipose varies, the production varies here, acts on hypothalamus and perturbs gene expression. And it perturbs it enough so you can see it even at the level of total gene expression in hypothalamus. What we've done subsequently is, is instead of looking at global gene expression in the target tissue, we've created modules. And now we ask, do genes in one tissue, individual genes, perturb modules in another tissue, right? in another tissue. And these are all secreted proteins. So this is liver and adipose. So for example, we can, here we have evidence that ITIH1 made in liver, a secreted protein, perturbs extracellular remodeling in adipose, right? This is a very simple method. It works, right? Marcus has gone on to identify a number of surprising uh, candidates and validated them. And the way we validate them is just by expressing the individual proteins, purifying them, and then injecting them into mice and asking if they have uh, the, the predicted uh, effects. So for uh, the last couple of years, we've been working with Johan Bjorkgren. Johan is interested in, in using network biology to understand atherosclerosis. And he has developed this, this amazing resource uh, uh, and it, would, it consists of tissues that he's obtained from individuals go undergoing open chest surgery, primarily for coronary artery bypass graft uh, uh, surgery. And um, uh, these tissues, this was, uh, Johan, I should mention, is at, at the, the Karolinska and also at, at Mount Sinai in New York. So from these uh, tissues, very small, tiny samples, he's uh, uh, carried out uh, RNA-seq, and using the expression data, he has developed 
um, networks for the tissues. Right? And here are skeletal muscle, mammary artery, aorta, and so on, various tissues that he's examined. Um, these, each symbol here is a subnetwork or a module. Let me, let me say a module. Uh, in some cases, these modules are associated with atherosclerosis. There is a, a measure called Syntax, Duke. Uh, this is case controlled differentially expressed genes, or at least two of these, right? So many of these are associated with atherosclerosis. And in fact, if you, if you take these networks and, and sort of mathematically ask how much of heart disease can it explain? It explains about 60% of the genetic component of atherosclerosis. Whereas uh, genome-wide association studies, the very latest ones, explain less than 20%. Right? So our, our part of this study was to try to identify the mediators of these cross-tissue interactions. You know, these edges indicate interactions within a tissue, let's say between modules, and the ones across tissue uh, uh, identify intertissue interactions. So using Marcus's method, we've identified about 400 candidates that mediate interactions between networks here. And, and um, so what we've done is, is now we've, we've just kind of to see how well we can predict, we've selected 10 mediators, and I've listed some of these in that abstract there, um, and tested them. So we've tested them by, again, expressing them, at purifying them and then injecting them in appropriate amounts into a mouse and asking, does that protein have the predicted effect on the target tissue, right? We're predicting that a particular protein, let's say in one tissue affects a, a module in another tissue. And so it, <laughs> we've, we've been very, uh, uh, we've had good success. So we believe that we can, with this method, identify many of the endocrine factors, most of these will be novel, that uh, mediate these cross-tissue networks. So the summary is natural genetic variations in populations perturb expression of thousands of genes and proteins, enabling relatively detailed graphical network modeling. Network modeling is useful not only for the identification of pathways, but also for discovery of causal genes underlying disease processes. And finally, omics data uh, from multiple tissues uh, of mice or humans can be used to identify endocrine mediators of cross-tissue interactions. And of course, the same method could be used to study mediators of intertissue interactions, right? Um, okay, so I think I've mentioned most of the people that contributed to this work. They're indicated in red here. But obviously, it's a it's a it's a group thing, and so I want to uh, thank my uh, lab members, my former students, and our collaborators. And I'll be happy to take to take any questions if you have them. Thank you very much. That was a a very interesting talk. I enjoyed some new terms I learned: mergeomics, which is very interesting. Appreciate that. I, I really recommend that for for people that aren't familiar with it. It uh, you know, again, one of the problems with network biology is that sometimes it's it's difficult to confirm causal relationships. And, uh, you know, with mergeomics, I think, you know, it, it sort of leads us to these key drivers. And the, the study I mentioned and some other studies, we've been very successful in actually validating the findings, which is reassuring. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I think we have time for maybe one, I'll, I'll ask around. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Laskazer. Uh, no, that's fine, Brad. I, I was just going to ask, uh, Jake, thanks for that terrific talk. Uh, tell me, uh, how are you pursuing the issue of, uh, of perturbation, sort of environmental perturbations across the different strains that you have? Are, are, they, are you trying to enrich for a particular phenotype and then perturbing, or are you looking sort of at the breadth of response to a perturbation across all genotypes? Well, you know, we are very interested in actually in, in environmental factors. I think particularly in our mouse studies where we can control the environment. 
And uh, uh, one of the things that we've done is, is simply look at omics data uh, under different environments. In the case of, of, of heart failure, we've, we've used isoproteranol to, to, to stress the heart uh, and do sort of uh, enlarged hearts and stuff, uh, altered uh, ejection fraction traits. We've uh, recently, there's been a, a model that's been developed by Hill for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And thus far, we've looked at about 30 inbred strains of mice using that. We've also treated mice with high fat diets and so on. So what, we, what we've done is, is, is measure, let's say in the heart, uh, proteomics or, or transcriptomics and so on under a variety of conditions. And then, you know, the simple thing is just to look at differentially expressed genes, the differences in the networks and so on. And that's been quite informative. Um, we haven't used sort of more specific perturbations, I would say, but it's actually turning out to be very, very informative. There's a, as you know, these kinds of studies uh, generate a ton of data. And I think, you know, the message I, 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 I would like to send here is that that even you know very simple network modeling like co-expression modeling and so on can be very very useful can focus this on uh, on certain pathways in the case of uh, uh, you know the uh, fatty liver disease it really made us think about mitochondria something that we we hadn't thought about by looking just at the the, the total data so so I guess that would be my answer so. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Lucis. So yes. our next speaker, uh, Dr. Marin, comes to us from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and he'll be talking about network medicine and personalized disease phenotype. Brad? Great, thanks very much. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, George, and thank you to the organizers of the uh, meeting here today. It's quite an honor to be participating among such storied and distinguished uh, physician scientists and scientists alike. In 2015, a major government initiative in the United States was launched, focusing on the uh, problem. Is our VSP? The PA um, pressures are, sorry, PA means are in. The promise of precision medicine as the next uh, objective in the way treatments are developed and patients are diagnosed. And of course, this was on the backdrop of completion of the whole genome sequencing project and ultimately was uh, passed as the first strategy for realizing precision medicine through GWAS studies and other large scale efforts that hinged on genetic variant associations with uh, human disease. And although uh, a number of critical gains have been uh, obtained through that process. I think with some perspective that many of the folks on this uh, conference might acknowledge that uh, complex cardiovascular or other clinical phenotypes may otherwise be difficult to explain by a single genetic variant. Take for example, the differences in various forms of cardiomyopathy where we can identify a gene pathophenotype divergence readily. Uh, take, for example, titanopathies, which uh, hinge back on variants in the titan gene, uh, which have been ascribed to, uh, to be associated with the development of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is a mild uh, left ventricular hypertrophy syndrome in the setting mother risk factors but also in other forms of cardiovascular disease that share very little in common when it comes to phenotype. For example, non-compaction cardiomyopathy, which is failure for the uh, wall of the left ventricle to solidify and compact. And then also in dilated cardiomyopathy in which the chamber is enlarged uh, and weak. And so this raises the question of whether or not uh, single genes alone can, can be useful for understanding different uh, converging pathways that may be important in cardiovascular disease. And our group and others have relied on network medicine, particularly uh, focusing on protein-protein interaction networks to identify novel pathways that are important for different endophenotypes in cardiovascular disease here, uh, as was described earlier for fibrosis. And we have also uh, begun to expand this into clinical phenotyping by looking at different 
uh, clinical testing modalities and ways to leverage network medicine to understand subgroups uh, better who share only vague uh, clinical symptoms at the time of presentation. But I think the next major milestone in network medicine when it comes to clinical phenotyping will rely on the interaction between biological interactomes and phenotypic data. This, of course, is the reticulotypes that we heard earlier from uh, Joe at the onset of the meeting. And the objective of this project was to try to understand whether we could innovate a strategy to give us better insight into this for obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a unique form of cardiovascular disease that's characterized by uh, impairment of blood flow through the outflow tract of the left ventricle uh, due to muscle thickening, which is oftentimes asymmetric and may be related to other uh, features. HCM in its most principal form hinges on uh, a few histopathophenotypic features, including uh, muscle disarray, interstitial fibrosis, and thickening of the small vessels that supply the heart muscle with blood. But the fact of the matter is that the clinical spectrum is quite wide for HCM and includes a number of different structures and a number of different features that are present to varying degrees in different patients, even though uh, they may share a common clinical diagnosis of HCM. And in fact, managing these patients at point of care often requires particular expertise to manage key features that may uh, be present to varying degrees in individuals uh, across the spectrum of patients with HCM. And of course, HCM is described uh, and portrayed largely as a monogenic disease. This is an unusual uh, pedigree uh, from a sperm donor, uh, from a report published in 2009 who carried a putative uh, disease causing gene for HCM and you can see all the affected individuals and there's no question that the inheritance pattern of HCM is important. It's given it uh, predictability in some, in some cases in clinical practice. But despite widespread availability of sequencing, the vast majority of patients do not harbor a known sarcomere mutation. And this has been the subject of accumulating data that has called into question the reliability of using single gene variants to describe the totality of information that surrounds this disease. This paper from Monray and Cohane and colleagues, which identified a difference in the expectation pattern for this disease relative to gene variants with the availability of more robust databases that include uh, healthy controls that are matched uh, appropriately for racial disposition and other demographic features. And these data have been recapitulated in other uh, databases and in other studies. And on the balance, leave us with a little bit of a, a dilemma, which is that this is a, a disease that was put forward as largely genetic. And uh, that's despite the fact that, uh, that patients who harbor a gene may not necessarily express the phenotype and that the gene in which the majority of variants have been attributed to the disease include sarcomeres, which are proteins that do not regulate fibrillar collagen, cannot explain other features to the cardiomyopathy. And so it begs the question, can we use network medicine as a way to clarify the interaction and the overlapping pathways that may drive the clinical phenotype? And to explore this further, we've uh, collaborated with a number of different groups and took advantage of access to affected tissue that's excised at the time of a standard of care surgery to relieve the obstruction in patients with uh, HCM. This is in fact my, my brother who works at a neighboring hospital. We were able to uh, get myectomy specimens, subject them to whole exome sequencing and compare uh, the results of these samples to those who uh, had tissue samples uh, isolated from hearts that were rejected for a heart donor uh, procedure based mainly on size mismatch. Uh, and so we can assume that these are largely healthy uh, controls. This shows the heat map of the transcriptomic pro profile of the patients with HCM compared to control. And not surprisingly, we see a nice separation by the first and second vector of the principal component analysis, whereby the HCM patients populate over in this region, the controls are over here. But what was interesting to us is that there's quite a bit of variance uh, across transcriptomic profile within the HCM cohort, raising the question of whether we could develop a strategy to analyze uh, these data in a way that leveraged that variability and did not consolidate it 
using typical methods that rely on mean expression values. So to accomplish this, I worked closely with Rusheng Wang, who was instrumental in this project. We first assembled a correlation matrix from uh, only the healthy control data sets and calculated Pearson correlation coefficients for every gene combination, and then perturbated this uh, matrix by the addition of a single transcriptomic profile from one HCM patient, and then monitored how the correlation matrix changed uh, by the addition of that patient. And then that patient data set was uh, taken away and the analysis was repeated until we had completed the analysis for all 18 HCM patients. We monitored for Pearson correlation coefficients uh, between gene pairs that were changed significantly by the addition of the HCM patient and then mapped all the gene pairs to the consolidated interactome to find gene pairs that were likely to be functionally related to one another. And only those pairs that were connected directly to each other in the interactome were carried forward for the development of an individualized protein-protein interaction network. Now, these protein-protein interaction networks are displayed here, all 18 of them. They may look similar to at first glance, but they're all quite different. And the overall topological features of these networks across the cohort are provided here. They uh, share about, a, I'm sorry, they have a mean of about 3,600 nodes and uh, about 3,700 edges. And what was interesting is that when we looked to see how the patient-specific networks differed within the HCM cohort, we could find that there was substantial overlap in the uh, features by virtue of the nodes, uh, but that this overlap was uh, far less when we considered protein-protein interactions that were common to all 18 uh, HCM patients. And furthermore, when we compared HCM to another different uh, kind of cardiomyopathy here, dilated cardiomyopathy, we saw that there was about a 55% or so overlap in the shared nodes between the two disease pathophenotypes but that overlapping characteristics could be extinguished almost fully when we considered only protein-protein interactions between these two uh, disease types, proving, at least to us, that in silico, uh, understanding the different pathways that uh, may drive the pathophenotypes hinges more on the protein-protein interactions than only the transcriptomic features themselves. We next focused on understanding whether these data could inform new modules within the human interactome. And this figure shows HCM and DCM genes that were collected from Phenopedia and mapped to the interactome, uh, showing here in blue for HCM, yellow for overlap, and green for dilated cardiomyopathy. And these data here, again, constructed by Ru Sheng Wang, were able to identify two distinct disease modules uh, and also demonstrating that patient-specific networks mapped much closer to each other and much closer to their respective disease module as compared to the disease module of the, of the counter-opposite uh, disease phenotype that we studied here. Now, I had mentioned before that individual genetic variants have been ascribed to explain a number of different cardiomyopathies. This, this figure from Elizabeth McNally shows that many genes are implicated in the development of widely divergent clinical phenotypes, all within the larger purview of cardiomyopathy. And so we became interested to understand uh, whether or not putative gene variants uh, associated with HCM could be mapped to any of the individual patient networks. And so we focused uh, on our 18 patient cohort. We lost uh, three samples for poor quality, but we're left with 15 of which we were able to focus in on 17 HCM genes that had been described uh, previously in the literature and observed that a putative gene variant or a likely disease uh, gene variant could be identified in four of the patient gene sequencing uh, data sets, which is pretty much what you would expect in a cross-sectional analysis of about 30 to 40 percent of patients in a given population of HCM will have a uh, putative gene, a disease-causing gene variant. What was interesting is that when we focused on the patient networks uh, and the respective gene variant, we were unable to identify or map any of those genes to the patient networks. Again, reinforcing the importance that 
protein-protein interactions that may not hinge solely on a specific gene variant can be important for understanding the pathophenotype of this disease. So we next ask the question, do individual HCM interactomes inform the pathophenotype and morphology? And to uh, look further at this, we focused on fibrosis and identified fibrosis nodes that were common to all 18 patient-specific networks, but then looked a little more carefully to find a subgroup that were differentially expressed in HCM versus control, and we're left with these four specific genes of which our attention gravitated to the gene JAK2, since this has been described in case reports of patients with extreme cardiac hypertrophy in the absence of a specific cause uh, going in line with the diagnosis of HCM, raising the question of whether this could be a novel pathogenic uh, pathway for understanding uh, a specific kind of phenotype that's uh, consistent with this disease. So when we looked at the mRNA transcript levels by RT-QPCR, uh, we identified a significant increase in the HCM cohort. And looking further at downstream targets of JAK2 signaling, we were able to identify not only co-localization of JAK2 in cardiomyocytes, but we were also able to look at uh, STAT3 and activated STAT3 across different uh, HCM patients. And what we found was interesting, but also consistent with our original position that the biology of HCM is quite heterogeneous. And in fact, although on the balance, we saw an increase in the uh, activation of STAT3 in HCM compared to control, we did observe extreme differences. Take, for example, HCM patient number seven, for which activation of this pathway is decreased relative to HCM patient eight, which had the greatest extent of STAT3 activation across the cohort. And when you quantify this regular to uh, uh, normalize to control, you can see quite a big difference in the amount of uh, transcript signaling that we see for JAK2 STAT3. We next asked the question, can we leverage data from the published literature linking STAT3 with COL4 as a target uh, and understand if that can be predicted in different patients and then inform on the histopath of phenotype and again, focusing now only on unique features uh, to each network, so taking out any features that were found across different patients, we are left with uh, truly bare bones features uh, of patient-specific networks. Uh, and comparing eight to seven, we see that COL4A2 is found in HCM aid, consistent with the immunoblot data, whereas in HCM patient number seven, we were not able to find COL4A2 in that particular network. And this corresponded nicely to a dedicated anti-COL4A2 immunoblot in the uh, heart homogenates, demonstrating that in HCM eight, there was upregulation of protein expression for this fibrillar subtype of collagen. This corresponded nicely to the overall fibrotic remodeling pattern. This is by uh, trichrome stain or picrosorius red, demonstrating substantial increase in interstitial fibrosis in eight compared to seven, again, internally consistent with our immunoblot and transcriptomic data. We next expanded our purview and looked at network features on the balance to see whether or not protein-protein uh, interactions containing at least one unique fibrosis node could inform differences in fibrosis burden. And so here we see the correlation of that network measure with interstitial collagen data derived from the human samples themselves. And you can see a positive association that is maintained even after you eliminate uh, some of the outliers that we observed in this otherwise small cohort. And finally ask the question, can any of this be used to determine patient level clinical parameters? Because if that were the case, then we could be building a pipeline towards using patient specific networks to bridge in silico data with histopathophenotypic data and then possibly with clinical parameters as a starting point for really advancing concepts around precision medicine. And to accomplish that, we uh, folded back on different structural and morphological features uh, measured by imaging, as well as hemodynamic parameters that are in and of themselves independent risk factors for adverse outcome in this disease, and found that network uh, fibrosis burden or density 
could associate uh, in a logical way with morphological and hemodynamic changes that were viewed uh, as adverse to patient uh, care and adverse to patient outcome. So in summary, the transcriptomic data from affected tissues, and these are rare myectomy specimens, which is an important point uh, to this particular project, were available and were used to develop HCM patient-specific PPI networks. We observed partial overlap over the content for each HCM network, but the major differences in the connectivity emerged uh, unexpectedly. And overall, we proved that HCM patient uh, networks are effective at delineating different phenotypes that are ascribed to have a common genetic thread, at least in silico. And we believe this is important for understanding the wiring map for determining different pathophenotypic uh, remodeling patterns in the heart. And overall, we identify STAT3, COL4A2 as a heretofore unrecognized pathway that may be uh, modifiable for uh, fibrosis burden in HCM. I'd like to just acknowledge a number of different investigators, but particularly uh, Rushang, who uh, has been a great partner uh, to our group and to, to Joe and everyone else. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, thank you, Brad. That was a wonderful talk. I think we're right up against our, our timeline, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. I know I have a few questions that I want to uh, pass on to you, but we can do that uh, uh, even later during our, our breakout session. Uh, why don't we now uh, move on, and I'll welcome Dr. Liu and, and Dr. Uh, Velarde, who will be giving us an update on the PPI prediction challenge. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yang Yu Liu. I'm a faculty member at Brook and Harvard. I'm one of the organizers of this protein-protein interaction prediction challenge, together with my co-organizer, Professor Paula Valadi from Spencer University of Rome. Today, we'll, we will briefly update you this challenge. Um, we have uh, many strong motivations of organizing this challenge. First of all, we all appreciate that the protein-protein interaction network or interactum offers global insights into cellular organization, genome function, and the phenotype, uh, genotype phenotype relationships. Yet, despite tremendous efforts in high throughput mapping, the continued data incompleteness of the human interactome largely uh, limits our ability to understand the molecular roots of human disease. On the other hand, the computational methods are increasingly used to predict undetected but potentially biologically relevant PPIs but we still don't know which competition method works best for PPI prediction. And for those of you who have never heard of this challenge, uh, this, slide, this slide provides you the history and the timeline of this challenge. So um, back in uh, May 2019, uh, Paula and I prepared a proposal submitted to the steering committee of the International Network Medicine Consortium. And uh, um, uh, fortunately, the, the steering committee approved our proposal and then in August 2019, we uh, sent out a survey to all the consortium members to call for interest. And re we received quite positive responses from many consortium members. And initially we planned to launch the challenge in early June 2020 and ask a participant to submit their result in the end of, uh, uh, in the middle of July 2020. But as you know, for obvious reasons, we have to postpone that. So the challenge was officially launched um, uh, in early uh, September of 2020. And uh, in November and December 2020, we prepared the, the challenge description. We finalized the ch challenge description and provided the challenge data, data sets to all the participants. By the end of January this year, we received six submissions. Uh, one of them is invalid. And so in total, we have five valid submissions. And uh, uh, from February to early March, um, uh, we as organizers, we compared the, uh, we, um, the, uh, we, we checked the performance of those submitted methods, and we also test uh, another uh, 18 methods. On March 10th, 2021, uh, we selected almost uh, 3,000 protein pairs uh, predicted by the top six methods, including those methods we uh, tested. And we sent those protein pairs to, uh, uh, um, for uh, experimental validation. Hopefully by the end of April this, uh, this month, I mean, um, we can complete the first draft of the summary article summarizing the, uh, these community efforts. And th then we're going to uh, circulate this article for comments. And hopefully by the end of June, we're going to submit this summary article. So this is really the timeline of this uh, project, uh, this challenge. 
And uh, uh, our overall objective of this challenge is to perform a community assessment to advance competition prediction of PPIs. To achieve that, we first uh, evaluated the performance of different PPI prediction methods using various performance metrics on both synthetic and real interactions. And uh, um, we also validate the predict protein pairs of the human interaction using uh, EC2 hybrid and um, pairwise test. And finally, we want to check if there's a best competitional method for PPI prediction. And if, if yes, we would like to recommend it to the community. In this challenge, we provided the participants um, va various- Yang, I think it's not, uh, I'm not seeing the shifting slides. Uh, I don't know if it is only my problem. I'm fixed on your timeline slide. Um, I don't know what happened. Mine are paused as well. Yeah, so seems it's not showing the, the, Hold on, the sequence of slides. It might be worth stopping the sharing and starting it again. Okay, I will redo. Sorry about that. Can you see my screen? No. That's, that's weird. That's like, um, Does Paula have the slides? Maybe she can show them. Yes, I can do that. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, let me. Mm. We are on slide five. Yes, let me. Oh, um, You were here and you were talking about this slide. Can you see it right now? Yang? Yes. You okay, see. you were on this one? Yeah, I think so. You're in the next one. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Paula. So we our, have a B plan, fortunately. <laughs> yeah, um, our overall objective of this challenge is to perform a community assessment to advance competitional prediction of PPIs. And to achieve that, we want to evaluate the performance of different PPI prediction methods using various performance metrics on both synthetic and real interactions. And to be really useful, really useful, we also want to validate the predict protein pairs using a EC2 hybrid uh, pairwise test. Next slide. Uh, why? Only part, of, only, pa only part of the slide is showing. Um, can you see my slides? I can see your slide, but not the full picture. I only see part of it. Uh-huh. What about now? No. <laughs> okay, so here you, you, you can see all the data set that you we, we have been using, Yang? I'm all, I, I only see uh, three of three of, three of the uh, Sets. Because I can see them all. I don't know why it happens. I can see them all. What about the audience? Do you see all the, 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 the data sets that we have been using? The five one? It's mm. cut off for me as well. No. It's just cut off for me as well. If you want to try quickly emailing me the slides, I can try to bring them up here. I sent, I sent you my email address, Yang Yu. Otherwise, if you want to try to just describe what you have and, and keep moving. Okay. Great. Yeah, I would yeah. just, right, yeah, otherwise oh, we're wasting time. So basically we provided the participants five different interactions from east to um, a warm and a plant and human interaction and also a synthetic interaction. Um, from the east interaction, we uh, um, 
we, we chose to work on a data set published um, in uh, three papers. For the C. elegans interactum, we use a data set published in a, in a Nature Methods paper. For the plant interactum, we use the, the uh, PPIs from the Arabidopsis interactum published in a, in a science paper. And for the human interactum, we use the latest version of the so-called HURI um, a database published, um, I think, last year in Nature. And for, for the synthetic interactum, we use uh, the DMC uh, model to generate uh, a synthetic PPI network with model parameters uh, uh, chosen to fit the network properties of the, the human interactum. Uh, next slide. Uh oh, um, so you only, you only see part of the, the slide. Okay, so that's really unfortunate. Um, so basically we, um, we provided five interactum to the part participants and we asked them to do the uh, term for uh, cross-validation and uh, using the, the following uh, evaluation metrics, AOIOC, AUPRC, and the precision of top 500 PPIs and uh, MDCG. And, uh, uh, and then we, we, we rank those methods based on the internal uh, evaluation. And since we only received five submissions, to be really useful to the community, we also, we as organizers, we also um, uh, test uh, an additional 18 methods. And uh, the credit should really go to uh, Dr. Xu Wan Wan and uh, Lorenzo uh, Madadu. Uh, Xu Wan Wan is, uh, is a postdoc working with me. He tested uh, 17 methods and uh, uh, Lorenzo uh, tested another method. So in total, we have uh, 23 methods tested. And then we select, we rank those methods um, and we select the top six methods. And uh, uh, from those top six methods, we selected about 3,000 protein pairs. And we sent those protein pairs to Professor Carterwood, um, um, Michael Carterwood's group for experimental validation. And by the way, the, the, the human uh, interaction we used in, uh, as training data in this challenge was also published by Professor Michael uh, um, Carterwood's group. So we are using the, uh, um, the, the so the, the same group is also testing the, the predict uh, protein pair. This way, we, we, um, we hope we can minimize the impact of any uh, technical variations. Okay, I think. Um, um, okay, right. I, I can try to continue to the point that I don't see what the others see because I see <laughs> the slide uh, entirely. Um, so um, once we have done this exercise of, of, of testing several methods presented by, by uh, participants, by uh, five different teams, uh, plus a number of other uh, published methods, the idea is um, to uh, compare the performance even with respect to the specific method, methods used by um, all the participants and by the other uh, method validated by, by the organizer. Um, so we, we use the, 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 the taxonomy that you uh, probably partly see on this slide, uh, which is divided in two. Um, so this, this taxonomy of um, uh, PPI prediction methods, uh, on the one side, uh, organizes into it the, the taxonomy, the different ways of modeling the nodes and the links um, of uh, an interaction. For example, uh, there are methods that model information at each node, uh, for example, sequence related features or protein structure related features or functional features of some type. But even concerning the links uh, of the network, there are different ways of modeling. We have similarity networks, we have interaction networks, which are perhaps the most popular, but we also have heterogeneous networks that uh, model both of those uh, links. Um, concerning the prediction strategy uh, that eventually produces an, uh, a, a prediction concerning some specific interaction, um, we organize the method according to four um, high level categories. These are also based on several surveys in literature, for example, similarity based methods, probabilistic and statistical methods, uh, methods based on, on matrix factorization and machine learning methods. Uh, which uh, are also of different types. For example, those who are uh, based on deep learning, on embedding system, or on graph neural networks. Okay, now that we have this, this, this taxonomy of different modeling and prediction methods, uh, then we could 
um, uh, arrange our uh, submitted methods uh, according to this taxonomy. Uh, and uh, you can see here that uh, out of the five submitted methods, the five, uh, the five teams, so the number here is six because as, as Yang was mentioning, one of the, one of the, of the systems was, was not uh, reproducible for a variety of, of reasons. Um, you can see that most of the network do not um, uh, take into consideration uh, informa node uh, information except one team. Uh, the majority only model some type of interaction between the nodes. Uh, the prediction strategy is, is variable from, from similarity based to probabilistic, factorization based, and uh, classic and uh, um, embedding based um, machine learning method. Uh, the second table instead shows all the other uh, methods which have been tested by the organizer. Uh, and a cross between a, a column and a row indicates that a particular method used that type of, of uh, uh, node modeling, link modeling, and prediction strategy. And even here, you see that there are methods that use more than one strategy altogether. Uh, this will be useful in the end to uh, understand why some of the methods will perform better than the other, just than simply showing what the performance are. However, performance are important. We also uh, asked participants to produce an evaluation of their systems that we, we tested in our reproducibility test, which are the following uh, four. Uh, we have the area under uh, the rock curve, uh, the um, AU PRC, they are, they are under the precision recall curve, the precision at 500. So um, how many good prediction are there out of the top 500 predicted and the normalized discount cumulative gain. Uh, we know that the first measure is a measure that is not a good performance measure whenever your data are very unbalanced as in this case, because most of the, of the um, uh, um, relation between pairs of proteins are expected to, to be non-existing. So the positive one are only a minority. Still, uh, there is a, a, um, it is a very widely used measure and we ask a participant to produce also um, uh, this, this, uh, this measurement. Um, here in this table, you can see for every um, type of interactome, uh, the uh, performance of all the method, you see that, for example, I don't know whether you don't see on the right or on the left, but let's say the Arabidopsis, you see that the first column show the, uh, the three measure, the um, precision recall, the precision at 500, and the normalized cumulative gain. Note that we are not using the, 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 the provided measure, but we um, uh, normalize all this measure according to the zeta score to make them comparable. Uh, plus, uh, in the second column, where you see the red and uh, the green bars, um, we present um, a cum cumulative measure where we sum um, the three zeta score for the for the three methods. Um, now, uh, this uh, in, uh, slide here uh, shows uh, the um, the performance of the various methods. Now we only consider those who perform it well. So the first six one. Um, um, and again, uh, note that what we are showing here is this cumulative score, which is um, given by the sum of the three uh, Z, um, Zeta scores. Um, and as you can see, um, we have a, a, a tentative uh, ranking of the proposed methods, although uh, these are still uh, not conclusive because what um, we decided at the beginning of, the, of this uh, exercise um, to value more um, real tests provided by um, clinical experimental data, which is not available still at this point. So this is not the final um, classification of the systems, but it is only uh, an intermediate um, validation based on um, the classic K-fold cross-validation uh, where you remove some of the positive 
uh, links and you try to predict them again. Uh, um, here, so stay tuned for uh, for knowing who, um, uh, which systems actually uh, perform it best. Uh, in this last slide, we have um, uh, we acknowledge all the participants to the challenge. Uh, um, Shu and Lorenzo who greatly help in all the experiments. Um, Michael and Hao who are working on the clinical validation and all the group of the Network Medicine Consortium. Thank you, that's all. And sorry for all this inconvenient in visualizing the slides. Thank you very much. I think you guys did both a very helpful and, and fine job given the technical problems. Um, we're just at the end of the, se of the segment, but I want to make sure if there was any quick questions that we had a chance to look at those. You can also regroup at the end. Okay, so obviously a very exciting initiative. Uh, perhaps uh, during the break, maybe we could reserve a couple minutes to address any questions people have about this uh, at that time. Perfect. All right. Well, our next speaker, Dr. Pache, comes to us from University of Rome, Sapienza, and will be talking to us about network-based approaches for the identification of cancer signatures from omics data. Dr. Pache? Okay. Thank you. I'm here, and I cannot share my screen. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Paola from Sapienza University of Rome, and um, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here. And uh, of course, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me and for giving this great opportunity. In this talk, I'm going to present uh, SWIM, a network based approach that is able to identify a small pool of genes that we call it sweet genes that are critically associated with drastic changes in cell phenotype. Recently, we have also developed uh, Zwimmer, a new, a new version of Zwimmer written in R that is freely available at this site. The uh, phenotype specific application of SWIM are broad and include identification of SWIM genes uh, um, in um, grapevine berry maturation, as well as in human cancer, including glioblastoma. Here, our publication of SWIM application in plants, here in human cancers. And here are the steps of the algorithms. Uh, basically, after a, a pre-processing and filtering phase uh, aimed to identify, of course, differential expressive genes between two conditions, we build the correlation network in which node are genes and the link occurs between two genes if the expression profiles are highly correlated or highly anti-correlated. Then a swim search for community in the network, and then it assign a functional role to each node in the network according to their ability to convey information with, within and between network models. And finally, it identify um, a subset of node called sweet genes. Now I am going to briefly present you our result on glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is the most aggressive and frequent brain tumor with a median survival time of 12, 50 months from the diagnosis. The mortality rate is extremely high to respect to other cancer with the five-year survival rate achieved for only 5% of patients. Glioblastoma is resistant to standard therapies like radio and chemotherapy, and its aggressiveness is due to the presence of cancer stem-like cells that sustain tumor growth. You know cancer stem-like cells are cancer cells that have characteristic typical of normal stem cells, like self-renewer, that is the ability to maintain their undifferentiated state, and the pluripotency, that is the ability to differentiate to specialized cell types. Cancer stem-like cells are resistant to many conventional cancer therapies and cause uh, relapse and metastasis. Thus, targeting cancer stem-like cells could pay the way for novel therapeutic strategies. We applied SWIM to this data set of SUA eco-workers, and our aim was to identify SWIM genes 
that, uh, um, uh, that could be related to the stem-like phenotype. And uh, in, this, uh, in this work of uh, Suva and co-workers, co the authors uh, identify as a four core of transcription factor whose induction was sufficient to fully reprogram the differentiated glioblastoma cell into stem-like cells. And uh, we use this further data set uh, of Schulter and co-workers that is very similar to validate our result. This is the uh, a sketch of the matrix given uh, as input to SWIM. Here, the heat map of differential expressive genes in the two data set. And uh, to build the correlation network, uh, SWIM uh, uses the Pierce correlation coefficient and the selected threshold, the selected correlation threshold corresponding to the red dashed line reflect the right balance between the number of ages and the number of connected components in the network. By increasing the, the threshold, the correlation threshold, the integrity of the network will be destroyed. Then ASWIM computes the average Pearson correlation coefficient for each node, that is the average over the Pearson correlation coefficient um, uh, between the expression profile of a given node and the expression profile of all nodes in uh, the network neighborhood of the selected node. And we recovered the well-known uh, data and hub classification, but uh, we also find a third peak for negative value of this parameter that corresponds to an additional class of hubs that we call it Fight Club hubs that are mainly anti-correlated with the network partners. Mm -hmm. That's the line correspond to randomized network uh, obtained by shuffling ages but preserving the degree of each network uh, of each node and uh, in order to find communities we may use this k-means algorithm and the script, the script plot in order to select a reasonable number of cluster uh, that correspond to the elmo in the error function then as we may assign functional role to each network node according to the Guimera Maral approach. In this um, paper, the authors define two parameters, the participation coefficient and the within module degree. The within module degree measure how node is up in its cluster by evaluating the number of links a node has in its cluster and the participation coefficient measure how node interact outside its cluster. In this sketch, for instance, orange node correspond to uh, local labs or module center because they um, mainly interact uh, inside their clusters. Light blue node correspond to peripheral node since they interact few in general and mainly, mainly in the and clusters. Um, the um, green nodes are very important nodes that are not local apps, but they, they um, interact both inside and outside their own cluster. We uh, draw the heat cartography map for glioblastoma in which um, points correspond to network node correlated according to the average Pearson correlation coefficient. Remember that the negative value of this parameter uh, colored in blue in this map correspond to Fight Club hubs. Among Fight Club hubs, uh, we can uh, highlight uh, a subset of, uh, of genes that we call as with genes that are important network connectors. This is the um, cartography map for the corresponding randomized network in which uh, uh, you can see a predominance of positive correlation and an absence of sweet genes. This suggests that the identification is, uh, of sweet genes is not a random event. Um, uh, summarizing uh, sweet genes uh, are characterized by high participation coefficient, meaning that they mainly interact outside their cluster by a very low um, within model degree, meaning that they are not local apps, uh, and by a negative value of the average Pearson correlation coefficient, meaning that they are mainly anti-correlated with their network partners. Here, our result uh, 
um, uh, for uh, um, glioblastoma. On the left, you can see the heat map of expression profiles of sweet genes. And on the right, you can see the heat map of uh, um, of the negative uh, nearest uh, uh, neighbors in the network. In the SUVA data set, we can see that sweet genes are mainly upregulated in stem line in tumor propagating cells, suggesting their potential role in the maintenance of stem like phenotype. Anyway, we can see a small group of sweet genes that are um, upregulated in differentiated glioblastoma cells, uh, meaning that they could promote differentiation. They are mainly enriched in focal adhesion pathway, and they are anticorrelated with a group of genes, uh, including the four core of transcription factor that are responsible for stem-like phenotype. Thus, we can see that while their activation could promote differentiation and restrain tumor growth, their repression could promote tumor invasiveness due to the loss of cell cell adhesion. This uh, very interesting result was also confirmed in the um, data set of Schulter and co-workers. In order to, um, to search for common with genes between the two data sets, we found a very important one that is fossil one. Fossil one, is uh, um, downregulated in uh, stem like cells, and this downregulation strongly correlates with the downregulation of many important genes involved in cell cell communication pathway in both data sets. Uh, on the other hand, the um, uh, upregulation of, of fossil one in uh, differentiated glioblastoma cells strongly correlate with the repression of the four core of transcription factor and uh, uh, in both data set. Thus, in order to investigate uh, possible co-regulation of these four core of transcription factors, we searched for uh, a richard motif in the promoter region. And we found that the promoter region arbor a consensus binding motif for fossil one. Thus, we concluded that fossil one could be a novel prognostic therapeutic biomarket, which could induce differentiation of cancer stem like cell by repressing the four core of transcription factors. These results were uh, already um, uh, experimentally validated by the group of Professor Filetti, and they are already accepted for publication. And uh, they transfected fossil one in these two cell lines, and the overexpression of fossil one lead to a repression of the four core of transcription factors, and uh, also to a reduction in the cell ability to generate aggregates, suggesting a low cell motility and an increasing number of the extracellular matrix component. By performing a chip experiment, they also found a direct binding from fossil one and the promoter region of the four core transcription factors. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the last few years, so we applied SWIM in the context of network medicine, and these are our publications in this regard. And in particular, as uh, has been already mentioned by Professor Roscalzer this morning, in this paper, we study the interplay between sweet genes and human disease in the human interactum. And we generalize this formula of the uh, separation measure in order to assess the topological proximity among swim-based disease module. We study 14 disorders, 10 uh, tumor types from the cancer genome atlas, and uh, two cardiac disorder, ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and COPD. And we found that with genes associated with specific disorders are not randomly scattered, but they, they form localized connected subnetwork. This subnetwork overlaps between similar disorders like uh, tumor more class or uh, cardiac disorders and are um, um, situated in different network neighbors for pathologically distinct phenotypes. 
um, we uh, end up with a swim informed human disease network where nodes are distinct disorders and the link occur between two diseases if they share a substantial number of ZUI genes. The sites of each node is proportional to the number of ZUI genes involved in the corresponding disorder and nodes are correlated based to the disease class they belong. Uh, finally, in this paper, in collaboration with Professor Silverman and this group, uh, we applied SWIM to uh, COPD. And um, we, uh, we found that uh, um, the COPD correlation network consists of three well-characterized modules, one populated by three genes that are all upregulated in COPD cases and uh, involved in COPD-related pathways like B-cell receptor uh, signaling pathway, one populated by uh, negative interactor of three genes that are downregulated in COPD cases, including a well-known GWAS uh, uh, genes like Ager and Kain-1. And um, the last one um, uh, is populated by positive interactor of three genes that are well-known immune gene signature that are in turn upregulated in COPD um, cases. Um, Finally, in order to demonstrate the disease specificity of ZWI genes, we applied ZWIM to another data set, COPD data set, and to ARDS, that is another lung disease with an inflammatory component. And we found that the two lists of COPD ZWI genes overlap in the human interactum, and they are topologically um, separated by the uh, RDS ZWI genes. And thus, we conclude that this suggests that different diseases can share similar endophenotypes, but the network molecular determinants responsible for them are disease specific. Um, I'm going to conclude and I would like to, to thank all my collaborators, uh, Professor Loscalzo, Professor Farina, Professor Silverman, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paula. That was a very fantastic uh, discussion and uh, appreciate the uh, review of the swimming protocol. Is uh, is there any questions here from the audience? If we have a few minutes, maybe I'll start by asking, what, what modifications do you think uh, might be useful for your method to further refine discriminating out different phenotypes within the same organ system? I saw you were able to do that with the ARDS and the COPD, but Invariably, there's overlap there. So is there a way to optimize specificity in, in segregating out different pathways? Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, we... Um, uh, okay, uh, what we need is, of course, more data set about uh, similar uh, endophenotypes, uh, like uh, in the case uh, of COPD and RDS, in order to better validate our result. And of course, um, uh, mapping the sweet genes on the human interactum uh, gave us uh, very new insight uh, to underline molecular determinants for um, similar uh, endophenotypes. Uh, some improvement, uh, of course, uh, could be uh, trying to better define uh, uh, the proximity between uh, the SWIM-based uh, network modules, uh, for instance. Great. Uh, Feixing asked the question, how can we improve reproducibility uh, and parameter distinction for network-based studies. Uh, any insights from your experiences with the SWIM method? Uh, excuse me, the, the, the first question uh, I can... Um... Uh, Peixiang asks, uh, how can we improve data reproducibility? Um, so, for example, looking at different, uh, different omic scale data sets and subjecting those to interpretation from one yeah. approach versus a different approach. 
Yes, uh, okay. Um, okay, uh, one way to, uh, to test re reproducibility is like uh, in the case of glioblastoma by testing uh, the performance on we swim in different uh, data set. And uh, we, uh, of course, we compare the, 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 the performance of swim uh, with other similar network-based tool, like for instance, WGCNA, um, that is a very famous and popular network-based tool for uh, studying the, um, and creating gene expression network and correlation network. But uh, uh, the, 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 there, there are some um, important difference between these two approach. Uh, and the, 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 the most important one is uh, SWIM uh, take into account uh, explicitly the negative correlation that uh, in WGCNA is treated at the same level of the uh, positive correlation. Anyway, in the, um, for instance, uh, in the um, working collaboration with Professor uh, Silverman, uh, we applied the WGCNA on the same COPD data set and um, uh, but for, uh, um, in the module identified by uh, WGCNA and in the list of the rarier gene that was uh, indicated by this tool, we didn't find a richard in uh, COPD uh, related pathways. Uh, and as uh, was a, just a, a little validation uh, of this the result that, uh, of course, the last word is given to uh, experiments. Well, thank you very much. I, I see another point by uh, Harold Schmidt, uh, but perhaps you could address that either separately or maybe after we're done uh, with the next talk, we'll have time to come back and address some of the questions that we didn't have time for. And with that, I'll pass it back to George uh, for the next speaker. Perfect. Thank you, Brad. So our last speaker uh, before the break is Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cohen comes to us from Harvard Medical School, and we'll be talking about big data and the comorbidity landscape. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Well, you know, I have to say I strongly resent being in this position in the um, in the speakers list because I, when I was a senior resident at Children's, I used to pride myself on bringing the team in uh, for lunch, uh, sorry, for breakfast before any other uh, team. And now I'm in the way of uh, your snacks. So that's terrible. So let me quickly uh, share my screen and let's let me try to uh, to dispatch the uh, talk as fast as I can. So share screen. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Okay. Let me maximize that. Is it looking like it should? Yes. All right, thank you. So let's try to get this done in 20 minutes or less. So um, thank you for inviting me. Um, when uh, Joe first came uh, to Boston, or a few years with him coming to Boston, he invited me to have a discussion with him and uh, Laszlo, and I found myself uh, collaborating with them on a paper that I wasn't sure I fully agreed with about um, networks and endophenotypes and the fundamental issue I had was that the net, the, uh, the network of analysis, the, the, yeah, the analysis networks did not look like the kind of network analysis that I was used to, which was more on the probabilistic Bayesian side. And nonetheless, I saw the, uh, that we had broad agreement in the underlying messages. And so it was a pleasure to write this paper. It's nonetheless true uh, umpteen years later that there's been a lot of convergence from both sides. And I hope to, uh, to uh, illustrate that a bit uh, today. So quick disclosures, I'm on a bunch of boards and scientific advisory boards, both, but my most important conflict, which I believe is for many of us greater than our conflicts with money, is I'm passionately biased towards my findings and hypotheses that I believe are sound until they're proven unsound. And so perhaps you'll disabuse me of my conflicts during this talk. So let's talk about autism. I'm going to use autism as a um, example throughout. So autism is a, um, a complex disease. And for a variety of political medical reasons, it's maintained, it's, it's stayed as a monolithic diagnosis in a way that heart disease used to look like in the 18th century. 
Um, and so in, you'll see that it has um, a diagnosis that includes persistent uh, deficits in social communication and social interactions, restricted repetitive, re repetitive patterns of behavior, and they, these have to be um, present in early uh, uh, development. And this is such a capacious uh, definition that you find uh, individuals who are uh, within this di DSM-5 diagnosis who are institutionalized, are uh, nonverbal, and with a uh, low IQ. And you also have uh, heads of, of uh, famous departments who uh, can meet these criteria as well. And so it's a very, it's not unlike many other uh, complex disease diagnoses where there's a, a huge amount of range of presentation that fits within this diagnosis. So I'm trained as a pediatric endocrinologist, those of you who don't know me, are, and I have a PhD in, in computer science for the second day of, second heyday of artificial intelligence. And um, I wanna tell you about a study I had done uh, shortly after I had used uh, a, uh, network of networks uh, um, infrastructure that I had built with Griffin Weber called Shrine to look at the comorbidity landscape of um, many, uh, many hospitals across the United States with, and I looked at the children with autism. And I had seen among other things that there were a lot of bowel disorders in these kids. And in fact, even uh, inflammatory bowel disease at a higher rate than in uh, compare, com, uh, match controls. And so I went to, uh, the um, the heads of uh, several heads of uh, developmental disease centers across the country. And I said, I said, what do you think about this finding? And they said, what they said literally, um, sorry, what, what they said literally was, and I quote, tummy hurts, no, bread, brain bad, tummy hurts. That is a verbatim quote. And the, the implication being that there was some nonspecific consequence of having an abnormal brain that would cause uh, abdominal pain. So I was fortunate to have um, visiting that with me that year, Finali Doshi, who was then uh, had just graduated from her PhD in computer science, machine learning flavor, uh, and spent two years with me as a postdoc. And she's currently an associate professor of computer science at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences here at Harvard. And what she did when I asked her or well, what you see in the data. Can you do it, take an unbiased look at it and see what you find? What she did, it was a very ingenious uh, effort uh, to look at the 15-year um, um, trajectory of these children after having blocked each of these children's uh, lives into six-month blocks. And within each six-month block, putting a one or zero, depending whether they had one of the three, 4,000 uh, comorbidities that uh, kids with autism have. Now, most of the comorbidities are rare. So it's a very sparse matrix. So it's a sparse network. And so um, what she did is she lined up these children's histories as follows and she clustered them. So basically the children who had similar comorbidities in similar times of life would end up together. And what happened uh, through this data set, we saw an amazing thing. One, there was a subgroup of kids, shown here as the x-axis is years, y-axis is uh, prevalence. We saw a, a group of kids with autism and seizure disorders going up to about 80, uh, sometimes 90% uh, uh, seizures in that subgroup. Another subgroup, which had a lot of infections and also a lot, a lot of autoimmune diseases at a, at a far higher level than uh, in the general population, like type one diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease. And yet in the third group that had a lot of psychiatric diseases like ADHD, anxiety, depression, and not shown here, but highly significant, but it's a much lower level of prevalence, uh, schizophrenia. And by the way, when I, uh, sh when I shared that um, with, um, when I published this, I had mothers coming to me in tears of gratitude in a way that frankly, I'd never seen in my, in my clinical practice because for years they've had these children that had these symptom complexes and they had never been recognized with great uh, morbid consequences. What am I talking about? So if you have a child has inflammatory bowel disease, they'll say, mommy, daddy, my, my tummy hurts, it hurts when I poop. 
when you're a, um, as is often the case, a nonverbal child with autism, you will find uh, that the response is to act out because they can't speak. They're agitated and hard to control. And what do pediatricians, that's us, uh, do? We give them major tranquilizers, which doesn't touch the pain, but takes away the ability to express uh, that pain. And so when we show these, uh, these complexes, not only did the parents um, uh, were thankful, but some of the insurance companies now started creating programs to screen for these complexes. I, I wanna quickly, so that's EHR data. I wanna talk about um, electronic health, uh, sorry, claims data from companies like Optum or uh, Aetna. In this case, it was Aetna data. And we were able to show that just looking at uh, the data across the hundreds of thousands of patients with autism in a database that has on the order of 60, 70 million Americans, we could actually come up with very good predictors of autism in the second child, better than any genetic predictor. So that, for example, we could see that um, if your first child was female, if your first child with autism was female, and any uh, subsequent male child had a risk of up to one sixth uh, of having autism. And on the contrary, if your first child with autism was a male and your second child was female, the chance was closer to uh, uh, one in 20 or less. So that was just to show you, uh, not the comorbidity landscape, but the, the predictive power of these claims data. And so Alain Laran did a very network analysis kind of approach to uh, these data. What she did is she took the fact that we know that autism is far more common in um, males than uh, females, a four to one ratio typically. And so she looked in, in human data in both the developing and adult brain for gene expression that was the most different in trajectory, the most different in trajectory between male and female. Um, so we're looking for those genes that are most different between males and females during development and adulthood and expression. And we can, because of the databases that we use, we're able to uh, locate these in different um, uh, organs within the brain. Then we took the whole, we obtained the data from whole exome sequences of uh, these families, mostly families, but some uh, simplex uh, uh, cases too, where we had the exomes on these individuals and we could find out where the um, uh, mutations were, especially the rare mutations that were uh, predicted to be likely to uh, change uh, function. And we found where they were uh, discordant. Uh, in other words, where the mutation uh, segregated with the autism phenotype. And as a result of that, we found a whole bunch of uh, pairs of uh, uh, genes or exons that fill these criteria and found several clusters of, neuro of just to summarize, of neurodevelopmentally co-regulated, sexually dimorphic, segregated deleterious uh, variation. And so we identified several molecular themes, many of which are well known, uh, such as immune function and synaptic function. But we found a novel one, lipid uh, regulation, which account for 20% of the signal shown uh, here with the sample genes. And so for example, very significant in lipoprotein lipase and uh, in uh, LDLR. Interesting. So, you know, the entire reactome pathway of lipid metabolism, lipid metabolism, including lipoproteins was very significantly enriched. And in both the striatum and the neocortex, in the, and so now we had a hypothesis to test. Could lipid dysregulation be a conversion etiology in a subset of individuals with autism? And so we looked at uh, these findings. Uh, wait, I'm missing a, ooh, I'm missing a uh, slide, forgive me. I was fiddling the last moment. So bad on me. So what we did, what we found is looking both at EHR uh, databases and at claims databases we found, first of all, that there was in families with, uh, in kids with autism, a far higher rate of dyslipidemia than even very sick kids um, matched in any uh, possible way. Even when we, when we, and even when we subtracted 
out the medication kids the med kids who had medications that might uh, change um, uh, lipid levels. Furthermore, uh, we uh, wondered whether th could this be just a rather than a genetic effect? Could it be that the family has a, a poor uh, or a diet that is lipidogenic? And we so we looked at the families through. Um, uh, both claims databases and EHRs, and we found that the unaffected child in these families had a very significantly uh, elevated um, odds ratio of uh, this lipidemia compared to others. And, and then, by the way, when we looked at all these genes that were found in our pathway, and we looked in at the uh, Jack's uh, mouse uh, uh, database, almost all the genes, the, the vast, vast majority of them are all associated with autistic-like behavioral uh, changes in these mice, certainly as autistic as some of the classical um, uh, autistic uh, mouse behaviors, such as those found in fragile X mice. So just to summarize, we went from this study of comorbidities across the Shrine database. Uh, we identified that there were subsets of kids who had different, either an immunological subtype or a seizure subtype or a uh, neuropsychiatric subtype. And then with a network analysis, we found a subgroup with a particular mechanism underlying their um, autism, which is now leading to a bunch of other very interesting studies that we're doing with uh, a number of health systems. That appeared, by the way, in Nature Medicine for those of you interested. So, in wrapping up, I see I have uh, six and a half minutes left. Uh, I'll try to, to do faster. So many of you know that uh, I'm involved as a PI of the Coordinating Center of the, um, of the Undiagnosed Disease Network, that, and Joe is a PI of the Harvard uh, clinical site of, of that network. And so this network has taken many kids um, uh, taken their uh, clinical history and done their genomics. And in this case of this kid who had lost walking and talking, uh, um, found in this case that this child was missing a, um, a, well, had a deficiency in the pathway of neurotransmitter um, uh, metabolism such that giving this child a, um, a neurotransmitter uh, precursor cocktail actually restored both uh, speech and uh, mobility to this child. And incidentally, his brother was caught even earlier as a result of this. And um, this is an out of date slide. I think we have now uh, gotten on the order of uh, 6,000 uh, applications and we've probably diagnosed on the order of about 600 uh, participants. But in a very early publication that we published, I think two or three years after we started, it was important, it's worth noting that um, we were able to um, diagnose about th a third of the patients who were being referred um, to us. But what was interesting is a third of them already had um, exome uh, or genome sequencing. They just had been incorrectly um, diagnosed or interpreted. And what we found was that was what was very important in the performance of the UDN as compared to these other systems was not only did we did they was the bioinformatics done well, but we had clinicians who understood who had a lot of prior knowledge about the relationship between different symptom complexes, different findings complexes, and genetic lesions. And that's missing in most of these machine learning frameworks, which prioritize which genes to look at. And so this allows me to bring up in closing a uh, work that I believe is the uh, point of convergence between uh, the kind of work that people in my department do and those that uh, work with Joe and others. And so uh, you, you almost have all heard, certainly have heard of um, uh, convolutional neural networks um, that's been used very effectively, for example, to um, analyze and classify images, but graphical neural networks allow us to um, classify or label nodes within a network. And um, it's really, it's a nice uh, convergence of machine learning 
and um, machine learning and the standard uh, representations that uh, graph a theory and graph a theory researchers have, uh, have promoted. And uh, Marinka Zitnik in our uh, department has been among the leaders of this. And what it really allows you to do is to include multimodal graphs and actually compute in functions that are in a principled way that allows you to classify, uh, uh, to bring in this knowledge from these graphs and then allows you to apply that knowledge to, for example, the um, uh, cases of patients with uh, undiagnosed diseases. And we actually have a pilot going on right now to see if we can bring some of that prior knowledge that I was uh, referring to that the expert clinicians in the undiagnosed uh, disease network have to, uh, can we bring that kind of insight through these uh, GNNs, uh, graphic neural networks, to actually fully automate the, the diagnosis. It's a tall order, but it's, a, it's, it's an exciting and I think most plausible so far um, effort I've seen to bring together prior knowledge in the form of graphs and uh, the large data set numbers that you get from these uh, clinical data sets. And in close, I will close now with an advertisement that as they say, God willing, in October uh, 21, we'll be meeting in Bermuda, to talk about the applications of artificial intelligence in clinical systems that we have everybody uh, that you'd be interested to meet from people who've had their, uh, their algorithms uh, approved by the FDA to leaders of Microsoft who are pushing this to even uh, August members of the uh, New England Journal editorial board. So I'll stop there and I'm glad to take any questions. And I look and I actually ended a minute and 15 seconds early. Thanks, Zach. It was a, another fantastic presentation from you and I uh, appreciate uh, what a wonderful story you have unfolding in two different ways. I think we're up against the uh, the coffee break. Maybe I'll ask a very quick question. Um, hey, Joe was going to ask a question. I think if Joe's about to skewer me, no, you're going to skewer. If you're going to go, I, that's a real pleasure. If Joe's going to skewer me, you should let it happen. But Brad's fully capable of doing that as well. <laughs> he is, but he's nicer. He's nicer than you. <laughs> I can be anything for a split second. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I defer to Joe. Of course, go ahead. No, no, no uh, I, I wanted to say, Zach, that uh, I think this, what you've just described about uh, the nuanced phenotyping really blends in nicely with some of the features that uh, Jörg Mink showed in his uh, virtual reality network analysis, where he basically built a knowledge graph onto the molecular network. And uh, some of those clinical features could be built right into that as well, of course, and uh, which is precisely what Marink is doing. And I completely agree with the notion that uh, there is not just room for people with clinical expertise, but it's an essential element. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely essential. And, and uh, you know, you can, you can have the best uh, mathematical minds work on sorting out exactly how best to analyze a, a graph. But uh, in this case, uh, without knowing all these subtleties, which can influence and be influenced by some of the uh, uh, variance in the molecular interactions you really can't predict properly. And, and I, I, the other point I was going to make uh, is that, um, is that uh, I'm so glad to see you push this in the UDN because, as you know, uh, most of the people in the Undiagnosed Diseases Network keep looking for that single variant to explain these incredibly complex phenotypes, which is, if I may say, foolhardy at best. It's, it's foolhardy. And this part that those of us, those who don't know, We've yeah. seen so many cases where a monogenic variant, a single variant, has incredible uh, pleiotropic expression across patients, and uh, so it doesn't. It, the, the reductionist approach does not seem to work well sometimes. That's all I was going to say. No skewering. <laughs> yeah, no skewering. Oh well, that's disappointing. So uh, thank you all. I'm glad to let you have your uh, coffee. Uh, enjoy. Thank you. All right, well, why don't we um, get back into it? And again, thank you all uh, to all of the, the conference attendees. 
uh, for staying on mute and coming off camera. So again, we don't have bandwidth issues. And thank you for all of our speakers so far. Great presentations and we've, we've stayed right on time. And I have the pleasure now of, of kicking off the afternoon session. We begin with Dr. Brunak from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and he will be talking about disease trajectories and precision medicine. Dr. Brunak. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, um, for the invitation uh, to speak uh, here. So we are uh, continuing uh, on a theme uh, similar to the one uh, SAC uh, talked about, um, longitudinal uh, phenotypes. And, and in this uh, talk, um, I will um, describe some work we've done in, in, in Denmark on nationwide uh, data across essentially all uh, diseases. So, um, so we are looking at uh, data that uh, are not lifelong, but they they actually uh, span up to forty uh, years, uh, where diseases uh, come after one another. And we're interested in the sy systematics in in this, and of course also ultimately, like SAC also showed, we're interested in in finding disease progression biomarkers that drive some of these. Uh, progression patterns and especially also what discriminates them. So we are not interested in putting groups, uh, putting patients in, in groups according to whether they have one diagnosis or not, but more how the longitudinal pattern uh, looks like. So uh, we got our social security number in Denmark in 1968. So, um, so our data is sort of linked over long periods of, 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 of time. And in general, this is not our paper, but it's, it's interesting when you look at different health services and models, um, those countries with the one payer system tend in, in, in Europe to have uh, the best uh, and most electronic data when you go back. And in, in, in this um, uh, graph here, some of the Nordic countries are, are very much to the, to the left here and, and are yellow. But you look at the, you can see the compare the averages uh, when you go to insurance-based models and, 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 and more, more mixed, mixed models. So, so we have a good situation for looking into these, uh, for example, diagnosis trajectories over long periods of time and see how they develop and what is frequent and what is rare and, and to stratify patients in, in this way. We started doing that some time uh, ago, and this is... Um, statistics from the first um, uh, paper where we compare females and, and males uh, according to age. You see the different diagnoses for inpatients, outpatients, and emergency room patients. You see, for example, all the pregnancy-related diagnoses to the left for the, for the, for the females. And, and this is sort of representing uh, 7 million individual trajectories. And then we, we uh, have constructed a sort of a statistical approach for finding out what has a statistical uh, direction going forward. And, and as I said before, this was ICD-10, but we can actually go back more than 40 years, but then we have to link ICD-8 and, and ICD-10. We never used ICD-9. Uh, with the death registry, we can go even, even further, further back, but I will not talk about this work that we are preparing on the, the Danish death registry. So we developed this approach for finding statistically significant progression patterns, so this will be linear trajectories, and then you can summarize them as networks. And we published quite a number of papers where we, where we go into many different diseases. This is a paper, a uh, recent paper from last year on, on depression. Uh, what comes before depressive episode, what, what comes after recurrent depressive disorder, and so on. And, and, and uh, there are many of these uh, networks where, where this is not disease co-occurrences, but it's uh, directional um, um, co-occurrences uh, that are, are significant. Here's another um, graph from um, uh, epilepsy patients that we are working on, not, not uh, published. But we actually now release the browser where you can interrogate the Danish data, uh, disease trajectory browser.cpr.ku.dk, where you can plug in ICD-10 uh, diagnosis and um, uh, make your own uh, graphs uh, using the Danish uh, data and, and the 7.2 million 
patience behind um, all of this. And, and, and um, I mean, there is no person sensitive data in this because this is all summary statistics for how diseases follow one another in this population. You can make graphs and you can manipulate uh, the data and you can try to compare to disease progression papers, uh, pa uh, disease uh, progression patterns that, that you see in other, in other populations. So here's a screenshot, for example, for Down syndrome uh, patients, Q90, and you see they, they have a lot of over-representation in a directional way of, of, of um, Alzheimer's disease and also other diseases. So you can play around with that. It was published uh, late uh, last, last year. So I would like to highlight a couple of other uh, papers and also some up unpublished work. And um, we published also last year late uh, some work on, on miss and over and under diagnosis. Of course, many of these databases with diagnosis and, and EHR data sets, uh, I mean, there's also a lot of noise in it. And we, um, we tried to develop an approach that could identify some of these diagnoses that possibly would be wrong. And we use COPD as a case because it's a known uh, it's known that, that uh, there is a lot of, of overlooked COPD, but also maybe misdiagnosed uh, COPD. So the idea is quite simple that we take these trajectories, compare them. So COPD is J44, and you can use this both, way to, both ways to, to say, okay, you might have J44 in a, in, in a very unusual context. Um, and, and then it might be uh, overdiagnosis, but the opposite can, of course, also be, be, uh, be true. And in this paper uh, that was published in NPJ, Digital uh, Medicine, we, um, we, we uh, made this very, um, uh, at first, strange observation that, that some of these um, uh, overdiagnosed patients, they had fewer comorbidities, uh, but they, at the same time, died earlier than uh, patients following a, a frequent COPD uh, trajectory. A lot of details in, in the cohort here that I will, uh, I will skip, but it, it was interesting that when we look closer at it, then some patients uh, died earlier, others uh, died um, uh, later. And it, um, it seems that some patients are actually truly overdiagnosed, so they, they, they die later. Uh, but there are also uh, misdiagnosed uh, patients that actually are maybe overdiagnosed for COPD, but then underdiagnosed uh, for, for, for something else. And, and what we discovered was that it was likely that these patients actually uh, were over, underdiagnosed with, 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 with lung cancer uh, and, and overdiagnosed with, with COPD. So they have an underdiagnosed lung cancer and they are not being treated for it, and then they die fast. And how do you prove that many of these patients are dead uh, already? But when we look at the lab values, uh, again, you just see one here for C-reactive protein, but you can see more details in, in the paper. Um, then it looked like actually these overdiagnosed COPD patients, they looked more like cancer uh, patients than, than average COPD patients. So this is one way to rationalize uh, that. But that is sort of an approach to clean up data and find um, uh, misdiagnosed uh, cases that actually also is um, a problem for, for example, GWAS studies when you have uh, false positives and false negatives in your case control data sets. So we also started to use some of these disease trajectories um, in predictive uh, models, and I can see other speakers have also talked ab about that, and, and, and we have worked on intensive care data for some, some years, and, and, and this is a paper published a few um, years ago, where we actually go to n equal to one and try to, to use the disease trajectory for one patient to make uh, a mortality prediction for, 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 for these ICU patients. And the idea is um, relatively simple. Uh, we have an old school machine learning algorithm here, uh, Perceptron, that receives the disease trajectory to the left, but then it also takes in lab values, vitals, and admission info that, that you normally use to, for example, compute the SUPS2 score 
the sub two survival score in 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 uh, intensive uh, care. So these data are picked up over 24 hours, while the disease trajectory data might be 15, 20 years. So we are really aggregating timescales. And it was quite interesting that when we compared the performance of the 24 hour data, that's the blue bar here. Uh, then if we compare to the disease trajectory uh, data, the predictive value of, of that, that's the orange bar, was, was outperforming the 24 hour uh, data. So when you essentially roll the, the bed into the, into the ward, you can predict, um, you can compute a better score even before the, 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 the 24 hours have, have passed. But of course, if you put the two data types together, uh, you see the green performance and you, you outperform uh, both of these uh, data types. So, so aggregation of timescales can be, can be um, an advantage. And for example, you see to the right sepsis patients, it's really uh, a, a strong, adva a high, a significant advantage uh, compared to the, the blue uh, Apache data. And, and in the paper, we also go into a lot of explainability and find the values that, uh, that um, leads the network and, and also identify some interaction between the 24 hour data and the disease uh, trajectory data. But I will not go into details on, 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 on that. Um, I will um, mention some data that we now have done, uh, not on diagnosis uh, data, but on, on um, uh, prescription data in much the, the same way. You see a map of uh, Denmark here. We have the same data for 7.2 million uh, patients, and you see the um, number of pres prescriptions uh, per person uh, color-coded here on the map. You see some of the islands, uh, they tend to, to, to be more, more unemployed and, 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 and have other problems, so the prescription level is, uh, is high. Uh, to the right, you see some statistics over, um, over time about how many prescriptions are being uh, made, and, and, and this is uh, altogether uh, more than one, one billion uh, prescriptions. But we try to look into the longitudinal uh, patterns of of, um, of these um, uh, prescriptions, uh, and of course, first you can you can use the ATC grouping to look at at how the males and females uh, statistically look like. You see in the bottom here, you see we have a lot of prescriptions when 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 we are uh, babies and, and 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 young, and then. It declines and then it it it, it grows uh, again when we are sort of 70, 80 years old, and there is some some um, uh, recognizable um, uh, differences between males and females. For example, the brown chapter here uh, kicks in uh, earlier uh, for 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 females than for for males. That, but there are many other. Um, uh, just in the statistics here, uh, many many other uh, interesting uh, patterns. Uh, but we developed a um, a model where we try to again find the frequent uh, trajectories uh, over time. And uh, as I said before, uh, more than one billion prescriptions. And then we see how the patients will go through the different ATC drug groups that you saw on the previous slide uh, down, down here, um, blood and blood forming organs, cardiovascular system and dermatologicals and so on. And uh, of course, it's hard to, 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 to see any, anything here, but, but, but you, you can see the seven steps that this amount of data, of course, if you had data from all of US, you will be able to get even better statistics um, but um, but here we we can compute uh, trajectories up to a length of, of um, uh, eight uh, steps given this um, uh, data. As we are addressing all drugs, uh, of course uh, there will be some some uh, uh, needs for for large data sets. If you would have statistical significant. Uh, progression patterns where one prescription will increase in a statistically significant 
weigh the chance of, of, of getting another prescription. So, so what is shown here is just uh, prescriptions, uh, uh, prescription trajectories, which are followed by more than um, uh, 1,000 patients. And we found out actually 9 million of these different uh, trajectories. But uh, how can you actually use this? And, and, and one of the aims in pre precision medicine is, of course, to, uh, to, to try to, to see um, whether we can use various markers and data to, to say this patient should start on second line treatment or third line treatment instead of, of uh, starting at first line uh, treatment. And in the paper, we go into uh, hypertension. Uh, essential um, hypertension and and um, uh, see whether we actually can can also make a predictive scheme uh, out of this where we use the prescription trajectory to predict whether a patient actually uh, would um, benefit from starting on the second line treatment instead of the first line treatment and then we we compare mortality of these different uh, groups to, to, um, to see whether it actually differs, whether you switch in time or you stay uh, too long on, on the wrong uh, drug. Of course, all, all of this can be then um, uh, uh, also combined with genetic data, but here we are just looking at the patterns in the prescriptions over these uh, many years. And there's a lot of power in doing this without the genetics, but of course, with the sort of pharmacogenomic angle, one can also explain uh, some of these uh, hop, hops uh, in, in, in prescription space that we also have seen in other, other recent papers. So, uh, so what I've been presenting here is um, uh, very much the, 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 the same line of, of thinking as, as SAC presented. Uh, here we have data from an entire country across all diseases, so we are not having enrichment for old people or young people or anything like that. We have the entire population. We also have a lot of socioeconomic data that we also are working on integrating, for example, in the browser that you uh, saw before. Right now, there is no socioeconomic data uh, in it. So um, we're interested in, in using this approach uh, to uh, redefine phenotypes as trajectories. And, and we also think that the trajectories in themselves can, can um, be used in various prediction uh, approaches. But again, all this could be combined uh, with income data, with education data, wearable data, patient-generated data, also smart meter data is, is a data type that we are working on. And all this in, in, in our country, in Denmark, is linked to the same number so that we can link data across uh, data types. So thank you again for the um, invitation. And uh, if there are questions, I'll be very happy to, to, uh, to answer them. Thank you to my, my group uh, at a retreat here and, and also some people that I will not go through name by, by name, but I uh, referenced the papers on some of the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soren. I, I see that Harold Schmidt had a comment to make. Harold, do you care to expand on that? No, I think it's been answered basically a couple of slides later. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Brad. Uh, Soren, thank you for a very nice talk. I, I wanted to ask you about the sort of um, range of normal health trajectories. How do you uh, plan on addressing that issue? That uh, it's not just a question of PRG code, but variations that are acceptable and don't necessarily lead to comorbidities or death. Uh, and given the wide range of lifestyles to which uh, our organism has ad adapted, I would imagine that's quite a, that can be a bit of a puzzle, especially from the prediction perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I mean, we all want to uh, predict uh, progression speeds, for example, for diabetes and, and define subgroups uh, who uh, progress slowly and those who progress uh, faster, and then of course also find the um, lifestyle um, complement of, of this that maybe can rationalize the uh, subgroups. I think 
it's all a matter of, of thresholds. Um, and for example, in the browser, you can manipulate the relative risk so that you see the strongest patterns or you see weaker um, patterns. Um, so I don't think we can can say that there is a um, well-defined number of subgroups in these longitudinal patterns. It more um, uh, depends on, on thresholds for how to um, uh, sort of set a limit for how, how, how much should the, the relative risk be from hopping from one diagnosis to the next or, next or one prescription um, to the next prescription. Um, that's my comment. Thank you. I think we have uh, time for one quick question. Ed Silverman, Ed Silverman asked whether you had accurate information about smoking history. Yeah, so 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 this is uh, largely based on um, uh, registry data, but we are working on a large data set where we have the complete uh, um, uh, patient record, and in 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 that we would have. Uh, smoking information, uh, blood pressure information, and so on, and 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 that has not been incorporated in these particular um, um, trajectories. But as you saw when I compared overdiagnosed um, uh, COPD patients at the lab value level, the same can be done with with, with smoking and, and 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 blood pressure and and other. Uh, patient features. So this is a good point. This is registry data, uh, but uh, when we use the complete patient record, we can go more deep into the characterization of the subgroups. Thanks very much. Okay. All right. It's my, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, George Washko, of course, Associate Professor of Medicine from Brigham and Women's Hospital, a pulmonologist. He'll be speaking on quantitative phenotype imaging. So Welcome aboard, George. Perfect, thank you, Brad. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Brad, for the introduction. Certainly thank you, Joe, and everyone for the invitation to be here today. It's, it's really a pleasure to be amongst uh, just a great group of scientists, uh, and, and there's been a lot of great talks. Let me see if I can advance my slides here. Uh, so first, begin with my disclosures, <clears throat> and I want to also start by uh, putting in the disclaimer that I will be talking about things imaging in the context of COPD. It is a complex disease, as people mentioned earlier, but it, it provides a nice framework for thinking about imaging and really the evolution of, of imaging over the, over the past uh, many years. So if we rewind and think back 1990, uh, we had a very simplified vision or view of COPD. And it was, a, it was a binary event. People were generally healthy, had some uh, fulminant respiratory ep ep uh, episode, came to uh, medical awareness, uh, found to have spirometric obstruction, was diagnosed with COPD. We said you have a condition, but we generally ignored uh, what happened beforehand, the pre-COPD. COPD. And of course, this belies the complexity of disease as we know right now. And at the time, people generally adhered also to the concept there, there being two respiratory trajectories. Um, you typically peaked in lung function around age 25, and then you had standard age-related decline um, right up until the, the end of life. But typically, you didn't succumb to, to respiratory disease because of the redundancy in your lung function. If you smoked and you were susceptible to injury from smoking, <clears throat> you typically had an accelerated decline in lung function such that you crossed into disability and then death at a much earlier age. If you quit smoking, your rate of lung function decline would typically return to that of a normal age-related decline. You would go back to being normal, as it were. And again, that too, we know, is probably not the case. And finally, we believed uh, then that there were really two legs to the stool of COPD. There was airway disease or chronic bronchitis, airway inflammation, mucus hypersecretion. There was emphysema, pathologic permanent dilation of the distal air spaces. Um, and a subset of people, uh, there was even a mixture of the two conditions. And we know now that there's actually much more to COPD than just these two pathologic states. 
Now, the imaging community about this time was just getting going. Uh, CT scanning was being introduced into clinical care. And the research community quickly jumped on this modality and said, we can objectify what we see. And so one of the first tools that they developed was something called density, densitometric analysis, where you could quantify the amount of airspace dilation on CT scan. And that's shown on the left there. The emphysema is actually shaded in white in the bottom left panel. A few years later, they said, well, we can solve the other half of this disease and we can actually measure your airway disease as well on CT scan. And what the community did is actually focus on the central airway morphology, the cartilaginous airways, and they said uh, that we can measure these structures. And we found that people with more severe COPD generally had smaller airway lumens and had greater airway walls as a, as a ratio of total bronchial area, the so-called wall, wall area percent. And there was great excitement about this and, and there was uh, great enthusiasm uh, across the medical community. They said, well, imaging now can enable personalized care and drive precision medicine in COPD. And of course that never really happened for reasons that I'll explain in the, in the, in the next few slides. So we know now that, that COPD is a complex and really lifelong condition. The foundations for disease are really laid in their 30s, 20s, teens. Some go far back as birth or even in utero exposures. It is a syndrome and we're getting more and more comfortable in, in having ambiguity in our definition of disease and, and our diagnostic approaches. We're also now learning that the features that we typically ascribe to disease appear long before the clinical uh, manifestation of the syndrome. And these are data uh, that we published. These are from Cardia. Cardia is a, an adult life course study that was started in 1985. It's funded by the National Institute of Health. And the goal was initially to, to identify risk factors for atherosclerosis and cardiac disease in youth. Um, now, the study had the, the great uh, foresight to also measure serial uh, spirometry, collect serial measures of lung function. And they also had CT scans of the chest, primarily for cardiac reasons, but that could be co-opted for lung purposes, uh, acquired at a mean age of 40, 45, and 50. So we went back and we looked at the spirometry and we actually aggregated people into uh, similar life courses or what we now call trajectories. And we also looked at those CT scans for emphysema, central lobular or uh, uh, paraseptal emphysema. And you can see, at a mean age of 50, a subset of those people, those in the black or the red trajectory, had almost 20% uh, of, of the uh, subgroup already had emphysema. If we rewind back 10 years to age 40, and that's young, um, five, eight percent of these people already had emphysema, and this is even independent of smoking. There was something about these people, susceptibility, some intrinsic design, those who had uh, less reserve at peak lung function were more likely to develop disease and manifest some of these features that we ascribe to disease. Now, unfortunately, pharma is pivoting away from COPD care. There was a tremendous amount of investment in drug development in COPD through the 2000s. And I think that really was as people started at, in the turn of the millennia, people said, we have new ways to phenotype people. This will enable, as we said, precision uh, care, precision medicine. And really the reasons for uh, that pivot away and now in retrospect are quite clear, nothing worked. And if we look, uh, it kind of makes sense in, in our current understanding. So there are multiple disease trajectories, and a lot of these drug studies were enrolling people in the mid-60s, 65, who had COPD and really lacked any historical data on these people. They didn't know where these people came from spirometrically. And you can see that you ended up with an admixture of people who peaked high or even normal and had a rapid decline in lung function, those in the red trajectory. And those who even had a low peak and a normal or even slower than normal decline in lung function, that black trajectory. Now, if you're recruiting these people and you're administering a therapy that you think slows the rate of decline in lung function, you can see that you have a woefully underpowered study because you have noise. Half of your cohort 
you just cannot attenuate the decline in lung function further because that's a process of aging. And in, then the imaging community in light of this also started pivoting back and questioning even some of their basic assumptions. In this case, we're looking at airway morphology and saying, well, how much of it is disease and how much of it is innate structure? And an example I have here, the person on the left, a smoker with normal lung function, a person on the right, a, a person, a smoker with 50% of normal lung function. And if you follow closely the arrows, you can see I'm, I'm pointing at those cartilaginous airways. And indeed the person with the low FEV1 has a smaller lumen, has an airway wall that looks to be a greater proportion of the total cross-sectional area, but the airways themselves are smaller. So it, it's possible, and I think certainly true, that at least in a subset of people with bad disease, it's by design. They just had a smaller tracheobronchial tree they have lower lung function, but this is not pathology. This is not remodeling. And if we enroll people based upon this, again, how does a therapy affect intrinsic structure of the lung? It probably does not. We've also learned that the absence of a key feature of emphysema in smokers does not imply resiliency to the noxious effects of smoking. Now the lung can have a, a widely divergent range of, of pathologic processes to exposure such as tobacco smoke. People can develop emphysema. People also can develop uh, advanced pulmonary uh, fibrosis such as the example I show on the far right. And a good deal of people actually have lungs that can't quite decide. They fall somewhere in the middle. They can have those more subtle interstitial changes that you can see at the base of the lung. And they may also have uh, some emphysema. These interstitial changes may progress to more advanced disease. They may be static, they may regress, or some of these changes may even uh, become emphysema at a later state. And so we struggle now with knowing what do we do with these people? When we think about subsets and we think of disease of COPD, what do we do with people that have pure emphysema versus people that may have mixed condition, emphysema and some fibrotic changes in the lung? Is that a different disease state? Should we treat it as such when understanding, uh, trying to dive into the biology of disease? We're also now looking outside of the lungs. So here's a, a good example. Uh, and on the left, we have a chest X-ray, normal, lifelong, never smoker. And on the right, someone with severe emphysema hyperinflation. And you can see the uh, flattening of the diaphragms. You can see narrowing of the cardiac silhouette. And, and really that's important. 50% of people with COPD die of cardiovascular causes. What's, what's the reason behind this? Is this inflammatory overspill? Is it some mechanical interdependence? Well, there was a lot of uh, talk and thought that there being extrinsic compression of the heart uh, by a hyperinflated lung. And that's probably not exactly true, right? If we think it, within the heart, uh, the pressures are about an order of magnitude greater than, than what you would experience standing in a lung field or, or even in a hyperinflated lung field. So there must be something else explaining this interdependence. And we believe that at least part of that is due to pulmonary vascular disease. Now, these are some data that we, we published back in 2019. These are all taken from non-contrast enhanced non-cardiac gated CT scans using techniques we developed in the lab. Uh, two examples, really a stylized representation of what our findings were, uh, roughly similar amounts of emphysema. If you look across the top of the slide, 18, 19% emphysema on the left and 18% on the right, and emphysema is shown in green. We did an AV segmentation of the intraparenchymal pulmonary vasculature, arteries in blue, veins in red, and also a epicardial segmentation of the heart. And what I'm showing the RVEV is the epicardial volume of the right and left ventricle. And you can see the person on the left has roughly half the size heart of the, of the person on the right. And then at the bottom, uh, it's really the opposite. And so this is, these are measures of distal arterial blood vessel volume with the absence of blood vessel volume uh, equating with vascular pruning or remodeling. Uh, and you can see the person on the right has roughly half of the distal arterial volume, presumably increased resistance to, to pulmonary vascular blood flow, right? This is the outflow track of the right ventricle. And the result is dilation of the RV core pulmonale, increased risk of death. 
So certainly the vasculature may be another area that we should explore in thinking about COPD and the syndrome of disease and the interplay of heart and lung in this and other acute and even chronic respiratory conditions. Now, the future of imaging in uh, diseases such as COPD um, is very broad and I think very bright. There are certainly a, a lot of great studies going on about new molecular imaging, new functional imaging, but people are also looking at the interplay of even data that we already have. We have silos of data from structural, functional, histopathology, and even molecular data. And what is the interplay of these two? Can we project all of these onto a common space and architecture like CT scan so we can predict molecular interactions uh, at a micro level just using CT? And can we maybe, to, to be less uh, grandiose or ambitious, can we even do this on a much uh, smaller incremental scale? Can we use structure to predict regional function? So what our group is doing uh, right now is, is focusing on that structure function basis on a, on a regional level. And here's just an example of uh, the first steps that we've done looking at perfusion maps. This is using dual energy CT scan. And you can see I labeled that as real iodine perfusion map. And on the, on the right, using the cyclogan, a single energy conventional CT to predict what a perfusion map would look like. And you can see we actually didn't do that good of a job. There's not a lot of overlap between uh, good perfusion, yellow, and poor perfusion uh, in brown. Now, though things change when we start to uh, use uh, additional constraints in our modeling. And so we then introduced our three-dimensional model of the intraparenchymal pulmonary vasculature with the hypothesis that the regions between blood vessels uh, generally are not as well perfused. So the bigger the distance between the vessels, the greater the risk of having hypoperfusion on our microscopic perfusion map. And you can see with that, we do a much better job. There's, there is very nice overlap between our proposed method, predicted perfusion map, and what we get from a real perfusion map. We're doing the same with, with PET scan. So on the left, we have a, a conventional CT that, that is typically acquired with a PET scan to look for the distribution of tracer. The middle column is FDG activity. Uh, the brightest areas are the greatest metabolic activity by the FDG tracer. And the images are right are a synthetic PET scan using only CT scan. Now it's not perfect, right? You can see there's some offset in where our signal is coming from, um, but it shows promise and, and it can be tuned. This, these are really the first steps. And so from macro to micro, from structure to function, there are rules that govern these relationships. And even if we don't fully understand those relationships, we can depend on their being there and we can start building these data and look beyond resolution what we currently have. And, and imagine what we can do now if we have access to healthcare systems data, we can index people, we can look for previously undiagnosed conditions using conventional and even advanced forms of machine learning and deep learning to process imaging data, which is one of, one of the most standardized data sets we have in medicine. And finally, I want to leave with, with a, a, a word of warning. And, and these are uh, data, what I'll show you from COPD gene. So COPD gene is a study funded uh, by the NHL LBI, uh, 10,000 smokers with a range of lung dysfunction. Ed Silverman, who's part of this conference is, is one of the PIs of this investigation. Each person uh, underwent volumetric CT scanning. Now we're approaching our th third time point of scanning. 60% non-Hispanic white, 40% African-American. And we, we've used these scans for multiple purposes. When we went back and said, well, let's do something different. Let's just see if we can predict ethnicity from a CT scan. No clinical data, nothing else, only uh, a CT scan. And we nailed it. It's actually, it's, it's scary how well these networks perform in doing things which we'd say is beyond the resolution, beyond what's visually evident on CT scan. But it's not magic, right? So there are well-documented differences in body composition, fat-free mass, and certainly in skeletal structure by ethnicity. And if I go back with a re-windowed image, um, and you can see the non-Hispanic white on the left, the African-American on the right, clear differences in structures of the chest wall. And this is important because as we think about developing models to leverage clinical data, existing clinical data to enhance care, we need to be careful. 
right? And these are data from our hospital. Black and Latinx patients had a nine and 17% lower rate of admission to the cardiology service. And we have to be careful because as we're building models in something that even we think is totally agnostic to ethnicity like imaging, we have to really question what data we're using. Do we use data that we have to build these models or do we somehow curate these data to what we wish we had free of bias? And in summary, these complex diseases, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, heart failure, they're a life course of events and their diagnoses are certainly imprecise. Uh, macro features, I believe, can be used to extend the resolution of existing data. Data curation is everything. It's all about data engineering and modeling. And we have to be aware of the bias in the clinical and the research data. And I just want to uh, acknowledge all the, all the people in my lab and my sponsors, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Great, George. That was an excellent uh, talk. Very exciting uh, advances on the imaging front relative to networks. I think, uh, unfortunately, it got started a minute or two late and we're up against the 3.30 cut. Maybe we can regroup at the end uh, for the 20 minute over, over session to address some questions, um, if that would be okay. Perfect, perfect. All right, well, maybe then we can pivot directly to Dr. Caldarelli from the University of Roman Sapienza, University of Venice. He'll be talking to us about brain network topology maps and the dysfunctional substrate of cognitive processes in schizophrenia. Dr. Caldarelli. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And uh, well, uh, I cannot uh, cannot share my screen. That's uh, the problem I am looking at the moment. So let's see if this works. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have the option to share the screen? You're on mute. Mute. Hello. Yep. Well, we can hear you. Yeah. Now. Sorry. I mean, I'm back. Okay. I still don't see how to. At the bottom of the. To share my screen. At the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. No. I know. I know. I'm I used to okay. Zoom. So let's uh, <laughs> let's do this way because it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't, uh, okay, okay, let's do, you should see something probably now, no? Is it okay now? Can you see? Yes, yep. yes. Okay. yes. Sorry about that, I very, very much apologize. So thank you very much for this invitation here and let's try to be fast and recover the time that I lost for this, uh, uh, my, my fault, I'm not checking Zoom. A setting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to present, I'm a physicist, I'm working mostly in application of network theory. And uh, what I'm going to present, I hope it will be useful for uh, anybody here. Uh, I mean, every speaker always think about that, but because this is a, a technical way in which you can use uh, networks in order to uh, phenotypize uh, the patients uh, to, to, to discriminate between healthy patients and um, non-healthy patients. And the case of study that I'm going to present, the, way, the, the case where we applied these ideas is that of the study of the brain. We started with the study of the brain because brain is a paradigmatic, is a paramount example of complexity. Uh, you know, you, you can imagine how to describe the functioning of a neuron, but then you put you know, all the neurons together and then you obtain something completely different. So this is a specific case in which more is different. So the behavior, the emerging behavior that you obtain is nothing that you can imagine by looking at the single neuron. 
and uh, and the point uh, the point is that this complexity of the brain uh, is a complexity that exists and is evident also when the uh, the brain is in its resting state not only when we are uh, when patients when people uh, that we uh, that we look at uh, are required to do any specific task, single or multitask, but even if they are at rest, then by magnetic resonance, resonance you can spot which is the activities in various areas of the brain, and by fMRI uh, you you can build correlation matrices of. Uh, um, correlation in the activity of different areas of the brain, even if the patients are doing nothing at the moment. So they're in what is called the resting state. So uh, I will be slow on that because this is what is, this talk is about. Uh, the case of studies that we're going to present uh, here are based on functional networks. How do we obtain these networks? Uh, we take several uh, patients, they are in the resting state and uh, um, time series from magnetic resonance imaging are obtained. Uh, this magnetic series refer to different regions of interest of the brain. And then out of these uh, analysis on time series, we are able to build by person correlation coefficient like the one that is uh, shown here, uh, we are able to uh, describe uh, how much two regions of interest are similar to each other. And we can also apply weight in these uh, analysis. This weight can be done in different ways. You can take the value, you can take the absolute value of, of this correlation. You can take something that resembles a distance. And uh, it doesn't really matter. These are technicalities, but uh, almost all of them are used in the literature. And out of these uh, weight, you can build a weighted adjacency matrix. So you can put in a matrix uh, all these numbers and see how much two regions of interest are correlated. Then by means of various procedures of thresholding in this analysis, you can build what is a network of the brain activity. And this networks connects vertices that are regions of interest. And uh, the strength of this correlation is how much, in some sense, they are correlated. OK, there is a vast uh, activity in this field. And this is a little bit of, uh, of the literature that you can look at uh, to, to, to check better what I just explained here in a uh, in few slides. What is important for us that are network theorists is that networks is uh, one of the few uh, methods in order to quantify, to measure them and visualize uh, several properties of the brain. Uh, so in the, what I'm going to show you in a while, we are going, I'm going to show you the activity that has been done by considering 116 regions of interest in the brain. And these regions of interest are more or less described by these areas, these anatomical regions uh, that you can find here. So these colors we will keep also in the following. And they refer to specific and um, very well known areas of the brain uh, where, uh, where this activity takes place. Uh, OK, so what we did, the, the first analysis uh, th that we that we made, and one point that I, I forgot to mention is that uh, whenever you're measuring networks from that activity, you would like to know how much the measurements that you're doing are relevant or not. So you need to have a very good null case, something against which you, you compare your results. And we obtained this null case by doing a, a randomization of all the trees that we obtain from our analysis and comparing single measurement against this ensemble of randomized networks. So the first, uh, the first measurements that we did, and this is a measurement that can be used essentially in any field of research in network medicine, is to study the percolating properties. So what is percolation? Percolation is a um, statistical model, story model of 
many years ago. And essentially you have a, a set of vertices and then you connect these vertices by switching on the edges. Um, as soon as you span your system, so you can go from one side to another side, then you have built a, a percolating cluster. So something that, that connects the two extremes of your sample. And of course, uh, the more edges you switch on and the, the more likely you obtain percolation and on the contrary, the more edges you remove from a cluster and the more likely you will split in two your networks. So this is exactly the properties that we are trying to check. And the first result that we uh, have is that whenever you're observing the correlation matrix of a given patient in a given case of study, well, the properties of this cluster of percolation in the network of activities in the brain are much different from the null case, very different. So what happens? What is the information in this figure? So imagine that you are starting reducing, uh, cutting the edges that, that are the um, weak, the, the, the weakest one in your system. So the one with a low value of, uh, of correlation. And uh, sorry, so this is something that I shouldn't do. So let's... Let's get a my, my song, but okay. So uh, imagine that you start, uh, you start uh, deleting uh, the edges, uh, the weakest one with the lowest uh, uh, correlation value. So what happened at the number of components that is on the Y axis? Well, not a lot. At the beginning, you remove the weakest, but you still have one single component. But then at a certain point, you have what is called the percolation transition. So after a certain uh, number of edges that you're removing, and more or less around the point 35 here of uh, value of correlation, then your network starts to separate in different parts, okay? So the point is that uh, the percolation threshold, so when you split your uh, giant cluster in various subset, um, happens much later in a real brain with respect to the randomized set of networks. And this is exactly what happens, what happens in the blue curve. This is something that Hernan Max noticed for the first time in a, in a PNAS paper. And uh, progressively cutting elements from the weakest to the strongest, what you obtain is a progressive disconnection from the giant cluster, but you can check what's going on there. And essentially, if you see, which is the aspect of uh, your structure in this part of the blue curve, then you see clusters of vertices who still belong to the same area. So the same color, the same part, red, violet, or purple, blue. And then as long as you proceed by removing larger and larger value of correlation, you end up with a network that is totally disconnected. But in this path, what you preserve, what you, what you still see is a structuring. So uh, parts that belonging to the same area remains connected. And if you do this analysis a little bit more precise, so you study two ways in which you can simplify the network by considering this maximum spanning forest. So you keep only the uh, nodes that are connected, uh, the edges that are connecting the nodes with the strongest uh, correlation. Then what you obtain is, is a picture of this kind where it's pretty clear that uh, vertices, regions of interest belonging to the same area are connected with each other. Um, you can compare then with the real structure with the randomized set and you see that the structuring of the right is completely lost. No? So what percolation analysis is telling to you is the inner structure of this correlation matrix within the various regions of interest. You can repeat this analysis for the spanning trees that is a way to connect these um, sub-trees in the forest. And uh, here is even more clear the structures related to the various, the various area of the brain. Um, once uh, we did that for forest and trees, uh, we decided also to use another properties of trees in order to uh, 
characterize classes of patients. And this is again, something that is very, uh, very basic and theoretical, and I, I suggest it can be used by everybody. Uh, firstly, okay, we, we reduce the complexity of a complete graph that is uh, the correlation matrix that we have in, in, any, in any situation, in any real experiment, by considering the spanning trees and the spanning forest. In such a way, you reduce drastically the number of edges. These are techniques in order to visualize the most important, the strongest correlation that you have in your matrix. But once you have the trees, uh, then trees uh, can be of different kind, a different shape, okay? Then you, you need a measure to, to, uh, to study these trees. For example, on the left, what is the randomized version, you have what is what we call the star-like branch tree. So you have a hub at the center and then all the others are connected uh, in the periphery. Uh, instead, there is a more interesting uh, structure on the right uh, that is a uh, chain-like branch tree in which, uh, I mean, there is some sort of uh, self-similar hierarchical organization that is telling to you that there is a longer range uh, correlation going on there. Okay, how can you measure that? This is the important part. This is the, the methodological part. Okay, um, we use that uh, structuring of the trees to compare uh, the behavior in functional networks and the brain for healthy subjects and uh, patients affected by schizophrenia. So let's, uh, let's skip to the, to the method uh, directly. Uh, firstly, okay, you can compare which is the value in, the, in these correlation metrics for the two cohorts, and you see that they are different, even if uh, the overlap is large. So, I mean, while, while you can still considering these as a signature that uh, the two classes are different, then you would like to have something more precise than that. And the idea that we had was what is called, uh, this is an um, old topological quantity that is called uh, allometric scaling. And the idea is that consider these uh, network that you, you have in the in the picture there on the left you have a tree on the right you have the net the, uh, sorry you are on the left you have a network on the right you have the tree that you can obtain out of this network and then uh, these uh, uh, tree as a root as every well behaving tree and uh, then you can compute uh, you can compute which is the size and we will call this size a of the sub trees present into this tree and of course, in a star, every subtree has a size one. In a chain, uh, the, the size of the subtrees increases as you proceed. In a branch and tree is, again, different. And then you do the integral of that. For every subtree, you sum up the uh, quantity uh, that are giving the, the size of the inner subtrees that you are in the, in the subtree you are considering. Uh, it's a sort of the integral of AI. There is a physical meaning of that, but for the moment, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. It's a topological quantity. So let's define in such a way. Uh, what it turns out that in many cases of interest and in this case of interest, this quantity, this integral is a power law with respect to the size. So C of a certain subtree scales like the A of this subtree raised to a certain power. And this uh, exponent uh, varies with the topology. For a stair-like uh, structure, this exponent is one. For a chain-like, uh, is this exponent is two. And in between, what is, let's say, fractal, so self-organized, as a, as a value, as a characteristic and typical value. So what did we study? How we compared the uh, two cohorts. So we were considering the minimal spanning tree out of the functional networks. Uh, for the two patients, the blue and the red, the healthy and the schizophrenic. And we uh, consider the value of this exponent. We consider that for the first, uh, the strongest uh, minimal spanning tree, well, then we consider for the second, for the third, and then as a magic, uh, you know, as you proceed by separating the, the various strengths in the maximal spanning tree, you see that the behavior of the two cores are very different. So the topology of the tree out of their network of uh, correlation in the functioning of the brain, uh, this value starts to be uh, different such that, that you can distinguish them. 
Okay, so let me wrap up uh, that. I mean, I've been very fast, but I didn't want to, you know, to, to be long, having such an occasion to, to be with you. And uh, so the take home message is that even simple quantities, topological quantities, like the analysis of the percolating uh, properties of the networks uh, that you can uh, infer from brain activity in the patients are enough uh, to show that how relevant uh, is the, uh, the data that you are measuring with respect to a randomized set of networks. Uh, in order to reduce the complexity of this huge number of edges and uh, this uh, almost comple uh, complete, not almost, this complete graph, uh, you can use uh, filtering methods like, for example, the maximum span and tree. And if you do that, you can find the inner structure. And in this case is a chain-like uh, branched structure of the uh, activity of the brain, even in its resting state. By using this technique, hmm, you can even distinguish between cohorts of different patients by studying how is the shape of these trees that you can obtain out of the networks. And, uh, and okay, I mean, and then there are all the, uh, all the, other, all the other properties that um, we, we measure and we find in our publication. So I would like to give uh, at least uh, one minute or two minutes if there are, if there are uh, questions arising from, uh, from this presentation. Let me just give some advertisement on that and let me more importantly acknowledge all the people who worked uh, in my group uh, scattered between Rome, Venice and Lucca. So thank you very much for your attention and apologize again for the trouble at the beginning of this talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, I think we're, we're up at 3.50 right now, but as we said earlier, we'll have a full 20 minutes to address some questions that may uh, accumulate between now and then. So perhaps best to go to the final talk of the session today, and then we'll have a group session after. All right, thank you, Brad. So our final speaker today, Dr. Adeker, comes from to us from UCSD, and we'll be talking about predictive, uh, predicting drug response and synergy using deep learning models of human disease. Uh, Dr. Adeker? Thanks very much, George. Can you guys all see my slides? Let's, oh, not yet. One second. No. Now you should be able to see my slides. Yes. Okay, great. So thanks, George, and thanks also to Joe for the invitation. It's been a lovely conference thus far. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk about, I think, some themes or certainly touch on some themes that have been seen all throughout the day, uh, starting with, with the grand challenge of, of my talk, which I think is the grand challenge of many of the network biology talks today. And that's the potential that a lot of us on this call think networks have for addressing genetic heterogeneity. Now, I'm going to illustrate that here with colorectal cancer, but of course, we've seen it illustrated today with autism, COPD, many, many different diseases. But here in, in colorectal cancer, what this, this uh, long tail or waterfall plot shows, it's, it's taking the genes uh, in the human genome ranked in decreasing order of mutation frequency in your average colorectal cohort. This one, I think, is the TCGA cohort, Cancer Genome Atlas cohort. So you can see there's four genes, APC, P53, and so on, which are mutated very frequently in patients, starting with APC at just over 70%. But then very quickly, you get in this sort of no man's land of, of incredibly rare mutations. So you have genes like PIK3R1, B2M, SMAD3, and so on that are individually mutated in less than 5% of your, of your patient population. Yet I'm, I'm marking genes here in, uh, in this tail for, uh, 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 for which we know a lot of, uh, uh, about those genes functions in colorectal cancer and, 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 and have strong belief that these genes are in fact functional. So, so the situation is this, like a lot of diseases, you have one, maybe if you're lucky, gene that you'll sequence in a patient that's, that's well known due to its, its common mutation frequency, and that'll be amid a sea of rare mutations. So the point I want to make, which I think, again, has been touched on, but maybe not quite in this way, is that 
in dealing with these rare mutations, they're certainly rare or even maybe so rare they could be called ends of one when you're looking at individual nucleotides. But as soon as you begin to abstract away above this level or here shown working down the page in terms of, of larger and larger systems in cell and tissue biology, you quickly can see convergence. Said another way, uh, all mutations in cancer must converge eventually. Certainly, uh, by, by the time you're dealing with the, the, the phenotype of cancer itself, all of these mutations, or at least many of these mutations, are somehow converging to give us the same disease. The question really is, are they, are they converging sooner than that in, in this pathway and molecular biology space that's shown here as, as a set of nested funnels? So as we know, starting at the top of the page, nucleotides converge on amino acids if they're in coding regions or enhancers and promoters if they're in non-coding regions. Those converge in, in genes and proteins, which of course don't act alone, but form molecular complexes. Those molecular complexes form signaling and metabolic pathways, which happen in organelles in different cell types and so on and so forth. And all of these different levels offer the potential to take a set of mutations which might uh, look different from patient to patient, but to realize that all of them are affecting say the same protein complex, or if not the same protein complex, the same collection of protein complexes in a metabolic or signaling pathway. For, for some very uh, uh, informative and abstract, uh, uh, one might even say visionary comments on, on the necessity of thinking about disease and other complex systems from a hierarchical perspective, I guide you to this, this nice review back in 1962 by, by Nobel laureate Herb Simon called The Architecture of Complexity, where, where in this article, he, he argues that we simply can't think about complexity in any kind of system, be it, be it a human biological system or a man-made system of some kind without this notion of hierarchy. So everything must converge. The question only is where in, in scale between, between genotype and phenotype that convergence occurs. So based on that, that sort of general uh, philosophy, my group has been collaborating with a number of others to, to really bring two key, key approaches to bear or key tools to bear on, on human genetic uh, complexity. One is, is mapping cell biology and ultimately tissue biology in this hierarchical way. And as we'll talk about at the end of my talk, very much uh, that this is all very much related to network biology. Uh, and then given these hierarchies, we've been availing ourselves of the, the startling advances in deep machine learning to, to uh, entrain machine learning systems to those hierarchies in translating genotype to, to phenotype. So I'll jump right in with, with our latest example of this, which uh, just came out in this reference uh, shown here. The two first co-authors are, are Brent uh, Kunsi and Jisoo Park. Uh, they were a, a uh, pharmacogenomics expert and Brent teamed up with a machine learning expert in Jisoo. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the goal was to, to apply this hierarchical knowledge of cell biology or pathway space to the particular interesting and relevant problem of, of translating the mutations one finds in, in, in one's tumor to a prediction of whether or not that tumor is going to respond to a given drug. The structure of the system that, that we built is shown down here at the lower left. It has three parts. So, uh, uh, and, and I should also uh, uh, note the inputs and the outputs to this system. So the inputs are the genotype of either a, a tumor model, such as a cell line or a mouse or a patient. And uh, the other input is, is a chemical compound that you're thinking of, of administering to, to that particular uh, uh, tumor represented by its genotype. The output of the model then is a quantitative response to, to, uh, to uh, the drug of that of that tumor. Now, the parts of, of the model are as follows. First, we, we, we embed the drug in a relatively standard way that's shown over here at the far right using uh, something called a Morgan fingerprint. So we take the chemical structure of the drug, 
we uh, hash it using this Morgan fingerprint. I won't say much about that because it's a pretty standard approach and I make no claims that it's better or worse than anyone else's approach for doing this. But the idea is you then place that chemical structure in, in some uh, low dimensional embedding, which, which uh, represents what are supposed to be abstracted properties of that, of that chemical structure eventually as the machine learns with response to, to, to the drug uh, of response uh, it, it elicits from cells. The more interesting part of the model is, is this part over here in green and it's how we embed genotype. That is to say the list of mutations or mutated genes that are sequenced in a, in a, in a tumor or a cell line model. The idea is the, the input to that is really at this point just a bunch of zeros and ones, uh, one character per gene one being uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a mutational event in that gene that, that we, or the, the pre-processing we employ, deems to be uh, potentially disruptive to gene function. Now, uh, instead of a black box embedding, uh, like we do say for the drug uh, uh, embedding over here in blue, here we use a biologically hierarchically motivated embedding. And so what happens is, rather than assign neurons uh, 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 in hidden layers, as is normally done in these black boxes, we do the following. Uh, you know, I'll just flip forward a slide so you can see this happening. The idea is every subsystem in our model is assigned a bank of neurons. And so for instance, let's take the example of, of the subsystem of DNA repair. I should also mention, uh, as I'll talk about in just a, a, a moment or two, we can get this knowledge of, of, of subsystems and the hierarchy of subsystems from a variety of places. Here at the beginning, we're just taking this hierarchical knowledge from the gene ontology resource, but it, it can also be taken from other literature curated pathway databases like Reactome, and as I'll, I'll discuss at the end of my talk, or formulated in a data-driven way directly from protein networks. But regardless, here, here we'll look at, say, the gene ontology resource. And somewhere in there, if there's 2,000 some odd systems represented by, by the gene ontology, you have one called DNA repair. It is assigned a bank of neurons to rep, or I should say artificial neurons here, the deep neural network. And that, that bank of artificial neurons represents the state of DNA repair. Now, importantly, the state of DNA repair or those neurons can only be affected with non-zero weights from the states of the corresponding neurons of subsystems of DNA repair in that hierarchy. So an example subsystem or set of subsystems would be double-stranded break repair or base excision repair and so on and so forth. And so only those neurons are allowed to update the, the uh, bank of neurons representing DNA repair. And so that's how the architecture of this, of this uh, deep neural network operates. It's not, it's not a black box, but every neuron is assigned explicitly to a system of cell, of cell biology drawn either from the literature or from, from uh, protein network clustering. In, in this particular example, as I said, it's Go, and there's about 2,000 subsystems uh, there. Now, the idea then is that uh, uh, that that uh, many layers of of, of biologically uh, uh, guided neurons now still will take a mutation pattern at the input and embed it into to a much lower dimensional space as represented by, in our case, just six neurons at the output of this model. And then finally, at the very end here in, in panel A, we, we combine the, 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 the very few neurons into which you've embedded the genotype of the tumor with the very few neurons into which you've embedded the drug uh, chemical structure. And uh, after a few more uh, hidden layers, you then uh, combine those two to, uh, to capture the response of that genotype to, to the drug in question. So that, uh, th that explains, I hope, the, the model structure. And I hope it'll become, if it, if, if, if it was less clear uh, 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 to you, then I, I hope that it becomes a little more clear as I, as I show a few more slides. But the last thing I want to describe before I move on is how we trained the model. How, so, so how we did it was we used a, a uh, now well-regarded and used um, a repository of cancer cell line responses to drugs known as the DEP map or dependency map. It's a collaboration between the Sanger Institute and the Broad Institute. It, at this point in time, has uh, a little over a thousand different cancer cell lines, each with uh, fully sequenced genomes. You get that, that input genotype we need. 
Each of those has been exposed to, at the present time, 684 drugs. Not every combination has been examined, but many have, giving a total of about 500,000 tumor genotype drug pairs for which you have a drug, a quantitative drug response. And it's those, it's those data that form the input and the output of this system for, for training. Let's now look at how the model performs. So every uh, point in, in these scatter plots is a drug uh, in, in that training set. And you can see over here in panel B on the y-axis is how, how good the model predictions correlate with reality. A uh, drug cell is the name of our model uh, of this, of this uh, visible neural network and trained to cell biology. And on the, on the uh, x-axis, you can see a competing model in panel B. It's a straight linear regression regularized by a technique known as elastic net. In panel C, it's a mash black box uh, so it's so deep learning, but without the, the biological knowledge of drug cell encoded in that, in that hierarchy. And so what you can see here is many drugs, many points line up right along the diagonal, indicating the performance is the same, uh, no matter what, what of these or which of these two or these various approaches you use to model the drug response. But then you have a, a, a significant minority of drugs shown above the diagonal here, for which drug cell captures something about that drug response better than, than a conventional approach. One such drug is paclitaxel or taxol. Uh, and one of the, so, so, so once you, you have a, a drug uh, that's, that's well predicted by the model, then given that it's not a black box, but it's, it's, uh, it's entrained cell biology, the immediate interest is to look at the pathways, look at the look at the subsystems in this in this large hierarchy that are the most innervated. That is to say, when when you when you expose cells to paclitaxel, which neurons are perturbed the most by that exposure, and to what systems do they map? That's that's the immediate thing of interest is to interpret why the model thinks uh, a, a particular tumor cell is going to be sensitive or not. Now, Taxol, as, as you may know, is thought to work by, by uh, mucking up uh, microtubules or interfering with, 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 with the cytoskeleton uh, function. And those pathways did, in fact, come up as highly ranked if you, if you look at what are the, the most perturbed pathways during simulation of the Taxol response. But you also see some very uh, uh, interesting unexpected pathways. And, and in particular, we saw many glycolytic pathways insulin uh, secretion in, uh, involved in glucose response, response to cyclic AMP, response to glucose, and so on and so forth. So what that did is gave Brent Kunze the idea, the, uh, one of the co-first authors, the idea that maybe you can use these uh, pathways that come up as important for essentially capturing mutations in, in cells that modulate the drug response to, to paclitaxel. Maybe you could use these pathways uh, as secondary drug targets or points of intervention. And to demonstrate that here, we have a lot more demonstrations of this in the paper, but to, to demonstrate that here, he took 2-deoxyglucose, which is a glucose mimetic that now is going to interfere with glycolysis, and uh, assayed combining that with the primary drug here, paclitaxel. And so what you can see down here in panel J is that when you hit just with paclitaxel, he, he's titrated the drug to give a, a very minor, small uh, cell viability response. Uh, he's done the same for 2-deoxyglucose alone. So at this concentration, you get very little response. But you get a, a whopping response, relatively speaking, when you uh, hit the cell with, with, uh, with these two drugs in, in combination. And so that's, that's it turns out, a, a anecdote from a much uh, greater or general theme that we found throughout this work is, is once you find the pathways of interest, that are, are mediating a drug response. And again, they're catching rare mutations or both common and rare mutations to do that. You, you can then often come in and drug that secondary pathway to, to, um, to useful effect. So the last thing I wanna show you in terms of, 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 of the, the use of this model is, is then translation to, to clinical populations. From, so, so you've trained now the model in, in this very, very large cell line repository and cell lines and high throughput screening approaches, of course, give you lots of data and that's why people use them. But uh, your ability to translate those findings to, to, to a clinical utility, of course, is a much, much harder prospect. 
Well, and and uh, not only is it implicitly hard, but it's also made made difficult by the fact that there just simply aren't great data yet out there, at least in the public domain, for for in investigating these kinds of things. But here, at least, we were able to investigate one such retrospectively constructed clinical trial by Smith et al. published last year as part of the the Genie project where they had looked at uh, uh, a population of estrogen receptor positive metastatic breast cancer patients, all of whom get fulvastrin, it's an ER antagonist, but then they either did or did not get everolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor. The theory had been that mTOR lies just downstream of AKT, and so patients that have this activating E17K mutation in AKT should respond to, to this drug. In fact, that's not what happened. And the left survival curve here is recapitulated from the Smith et al. paper. So you can see really very little or no effect of, of uh, having this AKT mutation on your drug response. Whereas drug cell, we noted, when we ran the same data through drug cell, it was able to predict a, a, a which patients were likely to respond to everolimus and which patients were likely not to respond to everolimus. And that's what's shown here at, at, at right. And if you look at, at why it's doing that, it's doing that, uh, uh, it is actually using AKT, okay? And that's what's shown down here in the bottom, but only after it's first looked at these blue genes to make sure there's no somatic mutations there. And so it's learned a, a logic that, that, that in retrospect also makes sense and is simply more complex than was originally thought. Uh, so I can see uh, uh, it's, it's time for me to wrap up and, uh, and I will do so. And so, so what I wanna simply say in, in passing is, is we can also construct these hierarchies for protein interaction data. And we're doing that together with Nevin Krogan's uh, group at UCSF. And it's, it's very similar to what Guido uh, uh, already presented today, uh, just before my talk in, in uh, using community detection algorithms and protein networks in a hierarchical uh, a way to build out these hierarchical uh, maps of protein assemblies. So um, with that, I, I'll just wrap up. Uh, I, I think just in broad strokes, I've, I've shown that, that uh, how, how network knowledge and, and prior knowledge more in, in general about cell, biologi or, uh, cell biological function can be used to structure these hierarchies of, of pathways and how those hierarchies can in turn be used to, to guide deep learning systems for understanding heterogeneous disease variants and mutations. And, and you know, if, if I, if I uh, insinuated at any point that this work is, 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 is finished, that was a mistake. I, I certainly uh, uh, would be the first to, to admit that this is, this is really work in progress. And I think a promising proof of concept if anything at, at the moment. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, well, thank you very much, Trey. It's a, a very nice primer to the beginning of tomorrow's uh, session, which will integrate uh, pharmacology with networks as well. So thanks for setting the stage for that nicely. I think from here, we're gonna open up the questions to uh, all the talks from the afternoon session. Maybe we'll start with you because it's uh, fresh in everyone's mind. There were a couple of comments here uh, I, I would uh, request that maybe you give measured responses just so that we can try to backtrack and get to some of the other talks that had questions that we might not have been able to get to. But we can start by uh, York's question about whether the match block, uh, black box uh, strategy produces edge weights that could indicate interesting and unknown biology. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So the, the problem, it, it might. The, at least in our hands, the problem with trying to interpret the black box neural networks for the same task of translating genotype to drug response is that uh, they're, they're uh, ill-determined, meaning, meaning if I train a deep learning system from different initial conditions 10 times or 100 times, I get very different internal configurations of those neurons. And so it becomes very difficult to, to it, it's, 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 it's unstable. And, and essentially, I think what that's telling us is there's many alternative configurations of these neural networks that are good at predicting some of these drug responses. But what you really want to know is what's, 
what's the internal configuration that most matches biological reality? And that's the sort of motivation for nailing these neurons to the cross, if you like, of, of cell biology. Great. So Paula asks, um, why the black box does not eventually converge the same set of weight as the knowledge-driven deep network? So I think I might have just answered this, that question. Yes, yes. Uh, could, you, could we say that in, in some sense, uh, the, 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 the additional value is the explainability of your network? Absolutely. So That's absolutely correct. And, and, you know, I, I think I did, I did mention there are some drugs that we think do get better predicted, but that's really, I think, not the point. You can, as some of you on this call, I'm sure know, you can tune these, these machine learning systems to have very good performance, and, um, and it might even be real if you're careful. But, but really, the question is, how do you interpret the, 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 the mechanism by which the model predicts a drug response? I, I welcome all of the participants to... Um, to ask questions that they may have had from before, um, maybe I'll maybe I'll direct one more. Uh, this was from this was from Jane Leopold to, um, if I recall correctly, to Soren uh, about really whether the whether there's over or under diagnosis of diseases in your system, um, and whether those data would let individuals know how best to test a patient or a diagnost diagnostician to pursue more information on a patient specific level. So that's, that was directed more towards Soren. Let's talk. Soren there, maybe we lost him. <laughs> oh, did we? Cause I was going to say, just to refine that a little bit, I was even interested to know if the data would allow you to understand what was the, the actual cause of the under or over diagnosis. Is it a systems issue, a patient issue, a test issue? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I don't see Soren on for now, um, but maybe Maybe you could circle back independently um, through an email. Maybe I can, uh, Brad, ask a question of, uh, of Trey and uh, Guido. And it really gets at this uh, notion that I think uh, Trey uh, expressed uh, most clearly and, and Guido um, intimated. And that that is that uh, that the complexity of some of these biological next networks that have that, that have evolved uh, to adapt to different environments uh, really uh, are a manifestation of a certain level of redundancy, and that reducing them uh, in some functionally relevant way will give us insights into not just the major determinants of a phenotype, but also the potential lead candidates for as drug targets, as uh, Trey illustrated. And I, well, I, I completely agree with that, that perspective. I wonder if both either of you or both of you might comment a little bit on um, not just uh, mathematical and, 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 uh, and uh, network-based, uh, graph-based methods for reducing the complexity, but how do you do so in the setting of vastly different biological readouts? That uh, you know, it's one cancer is one thing. There are you know twelve drivers for any particular cancer uh, and pathways that ultimately have to be activated or suppressed. And uh, you know, looking at cell proliferation versus apoptosis are pretty, pretty, pretty global and, and gross readouts. And that that makes the cancer field a little easier to ascertain some of these determinants and features. Trey, but when you get to other complex phenotypes uh, that are not uh, malignant it gets a little more challenging. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that. And Guido. Yeah, great, great question, Joe. Um, and, and, I'm, I, and I'm glad you mentioned the sort of 12 hallmarks because the way that I, I, I think you can couch what, what we're doing is exactly implementation of Bob Weinberg's hallmarks, uh, ex except you know, in a systematic network biology perspective and, and capturing. And, and in fact, as you look around the, the hierarchy uh, of, of networks, you, you do see exactly 
regions that correspond more or less to these different 12. I like to think about it as also inspired by the Bruce Alberts view of cell biology as protein machines. And so really, as you look around this thing, it's a bunch of protein machines nested inside each other that are implementing the higher the, the hallmarks of cancer. But your question is about phenotype, and, and you rightly point out that we've used the simplest possible one that people use in high throughput screens, a cell proliferation assay, or, or and as you point out, there's a few other simple ones you can monitor. I think moving forward, the way to think about it conceptually is that is essentially the phenotype of, of the, the whole hierarchy, of the root of the hierarchy. And in and, and my view, the, the, the funnel was down, right? I mean, you kind of funnel all the mutations into a cell phenotype. So really growth is, is a property of that last machine, the whole cell in that hierarchy. But I could unravel that phenotype going back, back uh, you know, into uh, different subcomponents and submachines of the cell and try to directly measure those phenotypes also if I simply had a way of doing it. So I think conceptually, I see how to do it. The question is gonna be, how we can actually practically do it through through the data we're able to collect today in 2021. Um, so, so anyway, I, I uh, if if that did not make sense, please let's follow up over over the phone because I, I want to hear what Guido has to say too. No, oh, that made, made made good sense. I I'll come back with another question, but let's let's hear uh, Guido if. Uh... Yeah, I mean, no, thank you for your question. I, probably I will not be very deep in the biological meaning of these, uh, of these evidence. Uh, I will keep on my comfort zone, that is the topology, is the mathematics. Uh, certainly, there is this complexity uh, out there, and uh, it's striking that when you reduce from uh, N squared, uh, values. You, you have a correlation matrix, so you have n times n values, and uh, the information is there. And then you decide to do a drastic filter and to take only one tree, so n edges out of n square edges, that in the structure of this tree, you still recognize exactly what you, you were saying, Joe. And um, so the fact that uh, uh, you have a structure that can be, I mean, some people also explain in this way, this kind of branching trees with this specific shape as the result of two different uh, trends. One uh, to be, uh, you know, to have uh, as much uh, connections as possible and one to reduce their number. So there is a trade-off in some sense. So this branching structure that we observe in these trees is the one that will maximize, uh, you know, uh, the, with some sort of redundancy, if you want, the connection between a certain area, but also gives uh, the possibility to span the whole system. So in this sense, uh, the, the topology that the network use, uh, this mathematics, this uh, shape of, uh, of these trees, uh, it's really it's really telling to you. I mean, I don't know the reason why, of course, that was your question, but it's really witnessing what you're mentioning. So the fact that uh, uh, the evolution in some way built uh, such a redundant structure that is redundant, but also optimal in some sense. So there is a trade-off of these two things. And this fractal structure is uh, really at the threshold of these two tendencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, why <laughs> you know more than me, probably because you study evolution, study biology, study all these beautiful things, but certainly we can measure that. So this is... Um, so, so, so I thank you for both of you for those uh, those uh, those answers. I think they um, uh, they raise an, another issue, which is let's distinguish cancer from non-cancer, um, and uh, propose that as complex as cancer is, as as you pointed out, Trey, you know it's easy to to measure cell proliferation as sort of a final common pathway that uh, really defines the disease phenotype or not. Um, and one can argue that a system like that is easier to reduce to some primary drivers that you can then attempt to drug or regulate than one that has much more subtle, nuanced 
uh, distinctions among phenotypes. So I don't know, let's pick something like heart failure or diabetes. You can imagine that in those instances, you're not really driving to some, uh, let's say, ultimate phenotype where you prevent cell uh, proliferation or hypertrophy, but you want to regulate a variety of features of both the cells involved and the system. And that this, the complexity of the network, molecular networks that govern those features of the phenotype are precisely, um, uh, are important therefore not to reduce so much, but to identify subnetworks within that allow you to modulate in a less than dichotomous way, you know, stop cell growth or not versus will, uh, will, it, will modify contractility of the cardiomyocyte or will uh, alter vasomotor tone uh, uh, in some way without um, uh, causing vasoplegia or ultimate vasoconstriction. That, that these sorts of uh, multiple protein-protein interactions that could be reduced have uh, sort of allosteric regulatory features that make the system pretty cool in terms of how, how it might be regulated. And therefore our job in trying to sort out what the most important, um, uh, what the most sensitive indicators are of a regulatory feature in one of these subnetworks, uh, challenging but interesting. Yeah, so that was probably a comment as much as a question, which yeah. I totally, so I totally agree. <laughs> um, uh, you know, back, back, it, it comes back to how do you model the ultimate phenotype? And clearly, I mean, the, the point I guess I would make is insofar as we can say someone has diabetes or someone does not have diabetes. Maybe there's, there's a fundamental philosophical question of whether that's a well-posed question. But if it is, then we should be able to factor diabetes then into increasingly fine endophenotypes, to use a word that came up earlier in the conference multiple times, right? And that's, and, and in my talk, right, the endophenotypes are just delving into the hierarchy to look at, at smaller and smaller machines nested inside of, of the larger ones and, and assign and, and study their states. And so I would be optimistic. Now, you're totally right. There's a reason why we've chosen cancer as the you know, as the first of as the first application, and you know, as I'm sure you also appreciate, we're going to have an entire career just getting cancer a tenth right. Um, but that's that said, I I, compl I also completely agree that there's a reason that that cancer maybe is the first one I'm presenting because it is the it's all about the phenotype. The phenotype is is something you can get your mind around. Anyway, that, that said, I do think there's a conceptual route forward and it really, I, I really do fully buy into the endophenotypes idea and, and it really just comes into how are you going to systematically factor heart disease into you know, endo, endophenotypes in a data-driven way? Uh, and, I, and I think there were some ideas today. Good. Thank you. Yeah. No, if I can just add something, my thoughts on this comment, I believe, and this is pretty important, uh, that this is the core, if you want, of the network medicine in the sense, okay, that there is medicine, of course, you're an expert, the, the biggest expert around, but networks have one use. They allow you to uh, build a metric, to build the distances in a space where these measurements are not uh, available otherwise. So whenever you have to, to say these things is similar to this other, this is different than this other, then there are fields like uh, the, the ones we are discussing uh, in this conference, in which network is the only way, okay? Uh, and this is why it's so important network medicine, because it allows you to do measurement, to do model, to falsify these models, you know, to, to change completely the perspective in this field. That's to me, I mean, but uh, I don't know if... Uh, you, you agree on such a view? I do agree with that. Yeah. I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, so what, what Trace it reminded me of, uh, um, I also really liked uh, Callum McRae's talk. And I was surprised by him using these patient derived cellular models, which I mean, they do have a more complex phenotype than proliferating or not, but they're still reasonably easy. I mean, they have a certain shape and they have a morphology. Is, is that considered to be, or is, is that an intermediate state that has more complexity than proliferation, but has 
to some extent already recapitulate something that we would find on a, on a patient level? Is, is that how we, we think of it? Who are you asking your... I don't know. The... <laughs> Is, I don't. Is Callum, I don't know if Callum's on. I'm, I'm happy to answer if uh, Callum's not on. I don't think he's here. Anymore. I, I, yeah, I can quickly also interject. I totally agree. <laughs> happy to say more. Yeah, I think it, it's it's a debatable point as to how well um, uh, those human-derived cell-based models reflect human biology. Uh, it, it, it really depends upon the phenotype and the and the and the source of the cell or what type of cell it is. Uh, as you begin to add more complexity, as some folks have done, um, uh, creating, for example, organs on a chip as another level of, of complexity, then some of what you might predict from a pure cell-based assay derived from iPS cells derived from a human source uh, may not be mirrored in the physiology of that more complicated system. So I would say uh, this is not meant to be negative. It's better than a mouse. And it's better than a zebrafish. It's not as good as a as a person, <laughs> but as a as a, if there were a straightforward assay that you wanted to assess, say um, some signaling pathway or some well-defined phenotypic feature, physiological feature like contractility of a cardiomyocyte, um, it, it's it's a reasonable facsimile thereof. Yeah, Trey, you may have a different view of that. That's that's fine. Well, I, I I think it just depends. Um, good for what, right? And and I think the the advantage of high throughput screens is they generate mounds of data that that of course are very compatible with some of the trends in deep learning and 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 the the, the and just more abstractly the the need to cover mutation space and genetic variant space. You can do it much more efficiently and systematically in model systems than you can, of course, in patients. I mean that was. That was the breakthrough for us, realizing that we had half a million drug response measurements sitting in, in those public high throughput screens. Um, but I think when you say what's you know what's good or you know good, better, or best, you're you're, you're talking about the phenotypes, right? And 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 how relevant they are for the clinical situation. And of course, you know, so so in all all of these situations, you can generate a lot of data um, that's less relevant phenotypically. Or you can generate a little data that's very relevant phenotypically, and it, it, I think to make progress, we're going to have to figure out uh, whether there's a way to knit those together. I guess one could all, you could always throw up your hands and say, "Look, there's no information contained in the high throughput screens that is is relevant to patients." I think some people would take that point of view, um, but you know, I, I certainly in my talk we were we were trying to leverage the fact that there is information contained that's that is translatable if you can extract it in the right way. Great. Any other additional comments as we sort of near the end point of the day? Brad, maybe I could just. Uh... Thank uh, all the speakers and the uh, and the and the audience for their uh, their participation. Uh, it's uh, been a terrific day. Lots of uh, great ideas. Um, I think lots of opportunities for uh, collaboration and interaction. And uh, we look uh, forward to tomorrow's sessions as well, where uh, there'll be a, a um, I think uh, an additional pool of terrific speakers as well as opportunities. So I thank you for sticking with it through the day and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Great, great day. day. Thanks everyone.